drop in the polls, but with that tie, they have clinched the Big Ten's berth in the Rose Bowl. You can see that, of course, here on ABC. We'll be with you at a halftime with the Prudential Halftime Report, but right now, five games of regional interest. Let's take you out to your games. We'll see you later. Good afternoon and welcome, everybody, to Jordan Hare Stadium in Auburn, Alabama. I'm Mark Jones, along with John Spagnola. It's Auburn against Georgia, one of the most heated rivalries in the entire Deep South. We have 0-0. That was just the second play of the ball game. Auburn has the ball as Georgia won the opening flip but decided to defer. We are... And now it is the diehard starting lineups for the Auburn Tigers. James Bostick is the main offensive weapon for the Auburn Tigers out of the backfield. Third down and five. White. He's got the first down and he hook slides safely into the 42-yard line. He was stopped there by Greg Tremble, the free safety. A pickup of 13 yards on the scramble. And now let's set that Georgia Mad Dog defense for you. First up, though, the offensive line. Wayne Gandy with good feet and good mobility. A great athlete, a tackle for the Tigers. First down and 10 for Auburn. The ball at the 41-yard line. Bostic and Richardson line up out of the eye. This is Bostic. And he moves the ball out over the 45 to the 46-yard line. The tackle there made by Charlie Clemens and Randall Godfrey. Let's now, I was so anxious before, let's set that Georgia defense for you. Wallace, Barnum, and Jackson up front. Jackson is the team's best pass rusher. The linebackers, a good group, led by Mitch Davis, number 58, 6'3", 237-pound junior. And Greg Tremble is the guy who is the leader in the defensive secondary. The Tigers now on second down and five. Two tight ends in. Here's Bostic cutting back over midfield and down to the 46-yard line. So Bostic very busy, John. But there could be a fumble on the play. The Georgia players are reacting like there is a fumble, and in fact, he did. James Bostic did pop the ball up. So the Georgia Bulldogs will take over in very good field position. The ball to the 49. Mike Jones and Greg Tremble made the hit on Bostic, which caused him to pop it up. Looks like Mitch Davis, number 58, may have recovered that fumble. A golden opportunity here now for Eric Zier, the starting quarterback. Only a sophomore, 11 touchdown passes, but 10 interceptions. Out of the offset eye, Harrison Hurst. Look at those quick feet. Averaging 7.7 yards per pop. Garrison Hurst, 5'11", 195 pound junior as we look at the diehard starting lineups. The backs of the receivers for the Bulldogs. Andre Hastings is the team's big play receiver. Second down and four after that gain of six by Hurst. Troy Stark starting in place of Alec Millen, the injured left tackle for Georgia. Play action, Zaire rolling out. He fires complete, it'll be spotted by the official at the 35-yard line. That was Brian Bohannon out of Griffin, Georgia, on the reception. A pickup of 10 yards and a first down for the Dogs. Pretty nice roll action there by Zaire. He likes to throw on the run. They like to move the pocket for him if they can. And Bohannon just ran a real nice comeback, and the ball was complete. Alonzo Etheridge starting in place of Ricky Sutton up front for Auburn. We'll take a look at the rest of the defensive unit in a minute. First down and 10, out of the eye. This is Hurst again, and this time he is met by James Quick Willis. Willis, one of the leaders from the linebacking spot, along with Karkin Cunningham and Benny Pierce. Cunningham has four sacks, and he is the unit's leading tackler. In the defensive secondary, Fred Smith and Calvin Jackson, a couple of good ones. Second down and 10, the ball is spotted at the 35-yard line of Auburn. The flanker screen to Hastings and nowhere to go. Good coverage that time by Calvin Jackson, John. 
Offensive coordinator Wayne McDuffie for Georgia told us he wants to get the ball into Andre Hastings' hands more often. We asked him how yesterday, and he said by quick screens. There's two ways to run a quick screen. One way is to throw it out in the flat, and the other one is to sneak that wide receiver into the middle. In this case, Georgia sneaks the wide receiver into the middle. Look on the left side of your screen. You'll see Hastings buzz in there. James Willis read the play along with a host of other Georgia, uh, Auburn Tigers. The ball to 35, third down and 10 to go. Zire fires it complete to Hastings, and he'll have the first down at the Auburn 22-yard line. So he comes right back to his main man, Hastings, a pickup of 13 yards. Actually, on the previous play, Calvin Jackson made the tackle on that man coverage, and this time Hastings is isolated on Calvin Jackson. We'll see this matchup most of the afternoon. Zyers rolling out to his left. It's a little, nice little shake move there by Hastings. He comes back to the football, as all good receivers do. It converts the first down for Georgia. Now, John, this offense doesn't waste time. They average 34 points a game. Tops in the conference. First. His teammates call him Scooby, and that time he scooted over the 20 down to the 17-yard line, tackled by Chris Schelling. That's one of the things, actually, that's hurting Garrison Hurst so far this year. And that is that he, there's so many weapons on his Georgia's offense, they just can't put the ball in his hands all the time. Nice five-yard gain here as Chris Schelling makes the tackle. Tackle. Garrison Hurst will break one before the day's over. He's, he's really a lot like a Walter Payton-type runner. A little bit of everything in his package. Second down and six. They give it to Harvey this time, and he'll be lucky to gain one yard on that one. Frank Harvey, a load at 243 pounds from Dawson, Georgia. Had a big play against Florida two weeks ago. He busted his first carry 80 yards for a touchdown. That time he had about 79 less. <laughs> a little different this time around. Yeah. Maybe Frank Harvey realized he wasn't 80 yards away and he didn't, uh, he didn't want to do it on this play. Good defense by Auburn. Third down and four now for the Bulldogs. Hurst. Bounces it outside and cuts it up and has the first down. Garrison Hurst down to the seven. His feet, John, are so quick. That's what really amazes me about him. Two things about great running backs that are just clear across the board, and that is great feet and great vision. On this play, Garrison Hurst starts out to his left. The hole is designed to go to its left. He cuts it back because he sees the openings and he has the speed to get there. That's what he did on that play to get a first down. Four rushes for her so far in the afternoon for a total of 18 yards. Picked up a good block by Brian Bohannon on that last carry. First down and goal. The man tackled at the four and a half yard line. A host of Auburn Tigers there to greet him. Well, Garrison Hurst uh, coming off a subpar performance. Only had 41 yards two weeks ago against Florida. And he'll be looking to up that a bit. But look, or, look at the number of 100 yard or more games. 11 in the last 13. Makes coaching easier for that guy. Second and goal for Georgia. Split backs, Hastings to the bottom of your screen. It's Hurst. Down to the two yard line and tackled by James Willis. So they've gone to Hurst twice now, John. What do you like on third down? Well, it's about third down and about two yards. Here at Hurst, you can see again, there's guard pulls in front of him, and he cuts it back, which he does so well so often. That was Paul Taylor, number 52, pulling for him. On third and two, this is a run or pass area. They're in I formation. Then they just try and roll out, see what they can do to Hastings on the left side. Two tight ends in. It's Hurst again, three times. Is it lucky? No signal as of yet, and I don't think he got in. And the crowd voices its appreciation for the defensive unit. Now, Ray Goff has a decision. He's pretty close here. He's got the control of the football via a turnover. And I think he's going to make a decision and take call a timeout whether he wants to go for it on fourth down. It's going to be about a half a yard, Mark. As we look at the replay, the tackle made by Damon Primus that time. It's been tough sledding, though, inside the 10-yard line since they got that first down. We're going to take a short break. Please, come on back. Well, it was Hurst up the middle, Hurst left, and Hurst right. It's got you fourth down and one if you're raked off, and they're going for it. 
I think you have to go back to Hurst on this play. Let Frank Harvey be a lead blocker. They line up in the eye. Hastings is split wide to the bottom of your screen. Two tight ends in. It's Hurst. Touchdown Bulldogs, and he fumbles it. But it's a touchdown. The signal came first. What a great run by Garrison Hurst. Frank Harvey was the lead blocker, and he completely whiffed on number 51, James Willis. But Garrison Hurst had the presence of mind to bow it out a little wider and find the seam and break it up in there. That's what makes him a Heisman Trophy candidate and possible winner in a couple of weeks. Garrison Hurst with his 16th rushing touchdown as Todd Peterson adds the extra point to make it 7 to nothing for Georgia. So the Bulldogs capitalize on that Auburn fumble at midfield and drive the ball down the field to lead 7 to nothing. A must-win situation for the Dogs, and so far they look good. Come on back. Canon CJ10. The power of color is yours. The more you take away from this Chevy Cavalier VL, the more it resembles the Honda Civic DX. Take away Cavalier's anti-lock brakes, base coat, clear coat paint. Take away its two-sided galvanized steel, automatic door locks, Scotchgard treated seats, and toll-free 24-hour roadside assistance. But there's at least one thing you'd have to add. 1500 bucks. The Chevy Cavalier. What else would you expect from the heartbeat of America? When the Schultz's home was damaged, they saw how State Farm reacts. Your State Farm agent and a State Farm Claims representative go right to work for you. We work together to avoid needless hassles and delays and speed your homeowner's claims to help you get your life back to normal as soon as possible. Our teamwork speeds your claim. It's another reason State Farm insures more homes than anyone else. State Farm is there. CFA College Football is ABC Sports Exclusive. Brought to you by Geo. Inviting you to get to know the newest Geo. Geo Prism, only at your Chevrolet Geo dealers. By McDonald's. What you want is what you get guaranteed at McDonald's today. By UPS, more reliable on-time delivery throughout Europe and around the world, you can trust UPS. And by the U.S. Army, learn how to get an edge on life. Be all you can be. We're back at Jordan-Hare Stadium in Auburn, Alabama. The score is 7 to nothing. Georgia over Auburn after that touchdown run by Garrison Hurst. He carried the ball 8 of 12 plays on that drive. Working overtime. And that's one of the things that Georgia really wants to do. Uh, they, had, they didn't do it that much against Florida, and I think uh, offensive coordinator Wayne McDuffie thought about it and said, I've got to get the ball into my big play guys. That's Andre Hastings and, of course, Garrison Hurst. We saw that on that drive there. Sure did. A lot of it. Here's the kickoff from Peterson. Back deep is Bailey, and he won't get a chance to return this. So the Tigers will start off on their own 20-yard line. And Stan White comes in for the team's second possession of the ball game. Saw Stan White getting a play from the sidelines. They're relayed from the press box by Tommy Bowden, who's up in the booth. He calls the play, relays it to the sidelines, and then, of course, Stan White takes it in. 27 touchdowns, 41 interceptions. Bostic and Richardson line up in the eye. Three wide receivers now for Auburn. Here's Bostic. He got over the 25. Nice looking run down to the 27 yard line. And there's a guy we talked about in the opening, John, who has really come to the forefront in the last few weeks. He has. In the last three games, he's had 461 yards. He's the leader of this offense right now. He, he got five yards there. It really didn't look like a five-yard game, but he also has explosive speed. 
they have used a lot of different tailbacks this year, and they may have found their man right now. Here he is again. Falls forward, and he'll be about a yard and a half short of the first down. The tackle was made by the nose guard, Casey Barnum, 6'3", 265-pound senior from Jacksonville, Florida. Auburn is very happy just letting Boston carry the football. He is going to be a good tailback in the long line of good tailbacks at Auburn. Joe Cribbs, James Brooks, and one guy by the name of Bo Jackson who had his number retired here in the last game against Arkansas. Well, Bo says he's going to be back playing baseball in spring training. Three tight ends in now on third down and short. Bostic again, and I don't think he made it. A lot of it will depend on the spot of the football. Well, they won't have to measure this, Mark. The nose of the ball just has to be to the 30-yard line. What do you think? You think it's too early to go for it? Yeah, I, cer down? I certainly do, especially after turning the ball over once. The tackle on the play made by Greg Tremble was able to stop the surge on the left side of the line. But when a free safety can uh, bang up a big old tailback like that, that's a great tackle. Terry Daniel now into punt. And Andre Hastings is standing on his own 30-yard line. This is a low returnable kick. A low short punt. It stops dead at the 40-yard line. A 31-yard boot and nothing on the return. at Jordan Hare Stadium the score is seven to nothing the Bulldogs with their second possession of the ball game on the first drive desire was three of three for 24 yards and Garrison Hurst did the rest here he is again the Heisman hopeful over the 40 stacked up at the 41 yard line Anthony Harris led the charge well Garrison Hurst really needs a big game today a lot of people feel since he only had 40 some yards against Florida rushing and I know Auburn doesn't want to give somebody a Heisman Trophy here <laughs> especially somebody from Georgia so they are going to play him tough all afternoon that's almost sacrilegious <laughs> second down and nine game of one on first down there's Hastings going in motion Zyre a little curl pattern, tried to find Hastings, but he threw him a nice bounce pass. Actually, that was Hassan Graham. Well, next Saturday, it's another action-packed doubleheader on ABC's College Football. 12 noon Eastern, 9 Pacific. The third-ranked Michigan Wolverines head to Columbus for a classic Big Ten showdown with the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Regional action follows as the number one Miami Hurricanes take on Syracuse, number six Washington against Washington State. Plus other games, check local listings for the game and starting times in your area. Third down and nine. Play action. Complete to Hastings. And he may have lost the first down, John, that he's like trying to get more yardage. You're absolutely right, Mark. When he caught that football, I don't know if he knew he was right on the yard marker, which would have given him a first down. So Hastings stepped back and tried to make a big play, and in that process, actually forfeited about two yards. Chris Schelling was there to pounce on him and push him backwards as we take another look at it. Okay, watch in Andre Hastings. He works himself into a curl area. Zaire hits right there. He lunge forward. He has a first down. He steps back, tries to create some more yardage. Doesn't get the first. And a nice punt here that lands on the goal line and bounces through the end zone. Scott Armstrong, strong leg, 52-yard punt. No return. That's tough for a receiver to know exactly where he is on the field. He knows that he's set up, and Andre Hastings was right there at the 50-yard line for a first down. But hey, I mean, he's a big play player. And he's the kind of guy who's like to break a tackle and make something bigger here. It's, it's almost instinctive. I mean, sure, you're, you're cognizant of the first down marker, but still you want to get more yardage. That's exactly right. Now, as a tight end, <laughs> as a former got a lot of I used to always lunge forward because I didn't want to be embarrassed running in the open field, but a guy like Hastings is going to break a lot of those. He's one of that uh, members of the 50-yard club. 
big play offense. Now it is Auburn's turn on first and ten. Two tight ends in. Play action to Boston. Flags on the play. The pass is complete. Sean Malone, sideline to Malone. The tight end, 6'5", just a freshman. Three freshmen out of that position to pick up a 15 yards on that play. Auburn has three freshmen starting at tight end. There's play action pass. That sets up the tight end in the flat. There's Sean Malone, a big target. Pat Dye kidded him the other set of day and said, if you drop, drop any more passes in practice, I'm moving you to tackle next year. That's, that's the curse for a tight end. <laughs> you see what the penalty is. John, we'll see a lot of that formation from this Auburn team today. That we will. They want to set up in a two-tight end offense, one back, and they, they'd like to attack Carlo Butler. Well, he's the smaller of the outside linebackers, and they feel like they get a size mismatch with their tight end. I didn't pick up the penalty, Mark. I, I don't know if you did, but it's first and 15 now. Alex Smith now checks in. He's the tailback. And he takes the handoff from Stan White. He got back about four of the five-yard penalty. They set up second down and long. The tackled by Mitch Davis. 6'3", 237-pound junior. And that's the mismatch we talked about with three freshmen down. You know, Fred Baxter, who was projected to be a number one draft choice for Auburn this year at the tight end position, is out for the year. And you have three freshmen. And uh, Pat Dye is worried about Mitch Davis and the matchup against his three freshmen. There he won that matchup. Second down and 12. White scrambling. Now that's what you call wise career planning, John. He ran out of bounds at the 16-yard line. There's a lot of safety in that boundary for a quarterback. They have, to, they have to not only get to the boundary, they have to get out of the boundary because guys will always nip at their heels. Well, at the conclusion of today's game, we'll be selecting a Chevrolet Most Valuable Player of the Game from each team. And for the 22nd year, through the Chevrolet Scholarship Program, $1,000 will be donated to the General Scholarship Fund of each school. Casey Barnum limped off on that particular play with third and 14. This is a situation Auburn cannot stay in much today if they want to win. They send in four wide receivers, and Stan White goes down at the 12. The first sack of the afternoon for this dog defense, Travis Jones, with his fourth sack of, of the season. That was just a covered sack more than anything else. Travis Jones comes from the inside and is able to beat the center on that play. I believe it was Greg Thompson. And I looked downfield to watch coverage there. Four wide receivers were streaking downfield, but they were all covered very well. So that means that Auburn will have to punt Andre Hastings Standing at the 46-yard line of Auburn. Daniels' first punt went to only 37, but this one is much better. Drives Hastings back to the 42. A flag down as Hastings with a nice shoot at midfield to gain some more yardage. A 48-yard punt and nine yards on the return, although they ran a lot more. Yeah, they're going to call a clip or a push in the back on that play. I believe it was Rodney McCoy pushed an Auburn player in the back and got caught so they'll be bringing this back that's exactly what it is John you know we see so much of that during this college football season why is that well first of all they changed the rule I mean they have the push in the back now versus we the have an illegal block in the back on the return team be 10 yard penalty your first down the other thing is it's really hard as a punt return player to block because you never know, you saw Hastings jiggle and jaggle there, and you never know what angle you have to take on the uh, defender who's coming down and covering the punt. And as a result of that, you think you're hitting a guy, but all of a sudden he shifts. This could be on the left, so you'll see it on the left side here. Actually, it's a, I don't think you will see it. It's a little further out. That player who went down right there was Cliff. Actually, that was Andre Miller there who got Cliff, so it's a tough block. Harvey and Hurst line up in the eye. The handoff is to Garrison Hurst, and a nice play that time by Quick Willis. Second tackle of the afternoon for him. One point. James Willis really gets after it. 17 times in his career, he's had 10 or more tackle games, so he really can start to pile up the tackles. And you know, uh, the Georgia staff was a little 
worried about the mismatch in that interior line and linebacking position. They feel like their centers and guards are the weaker players on their offensive line. And Auburn seems to be taking advantage of that. And of course, they're banged up on the offensive line as well. Alec Millen, their starting tackle, did not start this afternoon. As Zaire passes here on second down, and he passes up an opportunity to make yardage, and he's down at the 32. Tackled by Chucky Johnson and Randy Hart. Great coverage by Fred Smith, the cornerback. You won't see the coverage, but what you see is Zaire really having a little more time than he thinks he has. And then he starts to find a place to scramble and go down. Quarterbacks have to learn to stand tall in the pocket. That's why you'll see Georgia like to get Zaire out in the perimeter to throw on the run. Then he has vision in front of him. But in the pocket there, it seemed to me like he had a little bit of happy feet syndrome, which is not good for a quarterback. And credit to Auburn. It seems like they've gotten good pressure on him so far this afternoon. Play action. Zaire throws it to the sideline to Hastings, but it's ruled incomplete and out of bounds. So a big stand by the Auburn defense. And Auburn should enjoy their best field position of the first quarter after this punt. But did you see there how Zaire was out of the pocket? I think he's a little more comfortable in that element. He has to learn, and he's a guy that's very hard on himself. He really wants to learn every aspect of the offense. Puts a lot of pressure on himself. He's got to learn to stand tall in that pocket. And the coaches say he's been pressing just a little bit in the last few games. Here's the punt by Armstrong with five seconds to go in the first quarter. Bailey on the 25 and a fair catch. And the clock runs out. The first quarter ends. Georgia 7, Auburn nothing. The Tigers with the ball when we start the second quarter. And we are back at Jordan-Hare Stadium. I'm Mark Jones along with Jones Fagnola. It's first down and 10 for Auburn. The ball on their own at 25-yard line. White on the waggle, complete to Richardson. And Richardson has the first down and then some. Pushed out of bounds at the 42-yard line, a pickup of 16 yards for the fullback. This is a play we're seeing everywhere now in, in college football and in pro football, for that matter. Richardson is able to sneak into the flat off the play action to see the fullback. Now, the play action goes away, and Richardson is out in the left flat. The tight end is over the top of him. And Stan White has a choice to throw deep or throw short to Richardson. Richardson's able to, he's able to break a tackle there and get a first down for Auburn. Nice play. Then White, one of two, 16 yards. First completion of the day. This time he hands it off to Bostic. And Bostic is tackled at the 44-yard line. And John, that last time on the waggle, we saw them come towards Mitch Davis' side of the field, which is kind of interesting, considering they talked about going away from him. Well, that's right. Uh, one of the things you want is if you have a stout guy like Mitch Davis, you want to get him in the pass protection. If you have a smaller guy who's the other wide uh, outside linebacker, Carlo Butler, he's a guy you want to attack in the running game. And on that last running play, they attacked Carlo Butler. That's part of the Auburn offensive plan this afternoon. Second down and eight. The inside handoff to Bostic, and he's up to the 48-yard line. He got about two and a half or three. Right now, let's go back to New York for this update from John Saunders. John? Mark, Syracuse and Boston College in the Big East, and Syracuse strikes first. Marvin Graves on the option, thinks pass, and then spots an opening. Gets it to the end zone, three yards on the run. Seven nothing, Syracuse with the lead. Mark? Starvin Marvin Graves with the touchdown. <laughs> they're worried about Syracuse looking past this game to, uh, of course, to Miami next week, and they're worried about Boston College thinking too much about last week's loss to Notre Dame. Four wide receivers in for the Tigers on third and four. White incomplete. He tried to hit Thomas Bailey, but threw it low and too far ahead of him. Georgia plays a lot of man under coverages, and this is one of those plays where White was trying to get the ball to Bailey on an underneath route, trying to get him to break a tackle and go upfield. Terry Daniel on terrific coverage there. He actually had a lot of time to throw the ball, Stan White. That he did. That's a pass that should be completed. It was very good coverage, but still you could stick that in there, and Stan White probably should have. Daniel to punt, standing on the 33. And Hastings standing on his own 15 spiral that drives Hastings a yard deep. Now, it may be a safety. This is the second time today Andre Hastings didn't know where he was on the field. And it wasn't a safety. 
He almost caught it on the one-yard line. It was close. Chris Schelling was there to make the tackle, but Hastings really took a chance on that, John. That he did. And Pat Dye is hotter than the new Madonna book. Look at him. He's steam. Well, the referees are rolling a ball in the end zone. It is a down punt. It's a touchback. It goes to the 20-yard line. Pat Dye obviously disagrees. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in a second. A little controversy on the previous play right there. Andre Hastings is in the end zone. That's what the officials have ruled. The ball is a touchback. Good call by the official on that play. Garrison Hurst on first and ten. And he lost about two yards. Pushed out of bounds by Chris Schelling from his strong safety position who came up to make the play. A good call, but uh, I think the Tiger faithful would disagree with you on that one, Mark. Well, they're not very happy right now. They don't have the benefit of replay. <laughs> I think even with the benefit of the replay, they, they disagree. Loss of three on first down. Second down and 13. Play action. Zyre complete to the tight end, Shannon Mitchell. 6'3", 242-pound junior. With his 16th reception of the year. This is where Zyre's getting very comfortable with the offense, and that is picking out secondary receivers. He wanted to go to Hastings on that play. Mitchell was his second receiver. He found him, and they got a first down. Well, coming up on Monday Night Football, it's a big AFC East Division battle. Dan Marino and the Miami Dolphins against Jim Kelly and the Buffalo Bills. For the division lead, live, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Monday Night Football on ABC. First down and 10 after the reception by the tight end. Here's Harvey. And a nice defensive play that time by Calvin Jackson, who came up from his quarterback spot to force the play, and Damon Primus. Calvin Jackson, just a rookie. I should say just a freshman at 5'10", 160 pounds. But he really run for us there. When you can get a cornerback that can run for us, they recognize this play. Garrison Hurst will be a lead blocker on this play. But look at Calvin Jackson just get right through there and make the tackle. You love to see that out of your corners. They like the pass cover, but they have to be able to run for us, too. Real men, huh? Real men. Hastings in motion. And it comes this way to Andre Hastings. Put a nice move on the DB and made it out to the 32-yard line. Anthony Harrison Schelling eventually made the stop. This is the second quick screen we've seen to Hastings this afternoon. The first one was a quick screen in the middle. The second one here where Hastings is on the outside, and he gets a block from the other wide receiver, who's actually the lead blocker, Brian Brohan, and picks up some nice yardage for Georgia. John, that play is really bold right now. A lot of teams seem to be using that flanker screen. They are. It's, it's a mismatch. you got a like, guy like Hastings. These guys can break tackles for Georgia. They break one tackle, and they can often score. Third down, 10 to go. Play action. Zyre going up top to Hastings. And it's ruled complete. What a grab by Andre Hastings. Down to the 35-yard line and a pickup of 35 yards. What a remarkable catch. I mean, he was splattered by Clarence Morton to free safety. See Hastings working one-on-one. -on -one. He gets by the cornerback. Now watch Clarence Morton, 13, come over. as a battle for a football collision. And Hastings wins. John, I'm not sure he almost got away with a push-off here. Take a look at it with the off-arm. Uh, he may have a little bit, but the key there is the free safety, and he collided and battled for the football, and Hastings comes up with it. What a terrific catch by Andre Hastings. Big play, Andre. Back to the offset eye this time. Here's Hurst. Skates his way up to the 30-yard line, and he's run out of bounds. How about our conversation yesterday with Wayne Hall, the defensive coordinator for Auburn? I, he, he talked to us and said, you know, Hurst is six inches from the sidelines, and then all of a sudden he bursts up field and gets 20 yards, and that's what he did on that play. He, he run him into the short side of the field. You think the boundary's going to make the tackle, but he has such great balance that he can explode and pick up eight yards on that play. And that's close to his per carry average. Came into the ball game averaging 7.7 .7 a pop. Second down and two. 
Adrian Hurst in the backfield. Harrison Hurst with the first down and then some down to the 21. Lowers his hat and gets the first down. Let's take a look at the first quarter statistics. Uh, first quarter in which that one turnover, John, for Auburn really jumps out at you. It was the turnover that led to Georgia's first score. And you also see a balanced Georgia attack. You see no balance in the Auburn attack. They ran the football, but they didn't have a single yard passing turnovers. That is not the way for Auburn to win today. They want a ball control, but they can't turn the ball over. And Georgia, of course, is driving again now. Driving is something that they haven't done a lot of this year. They, they score with the big play. The handoff is to Harvey. Harvey dancing his way over the 15 down to the 13-yard line. Frank Harvey, John, he's a load at 243 pounds, but he moves well. What balance for a guy that size. Strong back, big legs. Last week he had the 80-yarder against Florida in his first carry. And he's a guy that is going to develop as a football player. He needs to improve his blocking, and I see him getting after it a little bit more today for Garrison Hurst, but he's a powerful runner. 243 pounds on your frame. Uh, that's, that's a lot of blocking meat. That certainly is. <laughs> well, Hannon lined up to the short side of the field. There's Garrison Hurst up the middle. And Hurst was pricked up by number 13, Clarence Morton, or else it was six points. Schelling was also in the neighborhood. This is another classic example of a great running back coming right at you. Garrison Hurst sees the openings. There's Willis, 51, trying to make the tackle. Good block by the center on him. Look at the open field cuts, though. Look how he sees where the opening is, tries to get it into the end zone. Of course, number 13, Clarence Morton, came up with the tackle, but it's first down and goal to go for Georgia. They have moved the ball methodically downfield this afternoon. Out of the split back formation, here's Hurst, and he picked up two yards. He's down to the three-yard line before he's tackled by Anthony Harris from his linebacking position. Now, Mark, you talked earlier about a ball control drive here, a time-consuming drive for Georgia, and you're right, they, they explode. They score from all over the football field, and this is uncharacteristic for them. As a matter of fact, despite the fact that they've scored so many points this year, they are a team that has actually been out time of possession, if you will, five minutes per game. So they only have the ball an average of 27 minutes a game. Now, what was that saying about stats? <laughs> Second down, here's Harvey up the middle. And Harvey made it down to the one-yard line. You know, John, the head coach, the offensive coordinator, Wayne McDuffie, were both concerned about their offensive line, which was beat up. So far, how does it appear to be going in the trenches? So far, I would say that it's pretty much even. I, don't, I can't say that either side has outplayed the other. We've seen James Willis do a lot of flashing. I mean, the key right now in this drive is the big play and the big catch by Andre Hastings. But this Auburn defense is going to wear down as time goes on particularly if Georgia can ball control the way they have. Two tight ends in. First, the deep back in the eye. That's Harvey trying to go over top. And no signal, no touchdown. And we're going to be left with another fourth and goal. I'm sure the Ray Goff is probably going to go the same route he did in the first quarter. Whitehead and Willis were in on that tackle as Frank Harvey went airborne. Harvey at 240 pounds, I think with that kind of frame and that kind of size, he's better served going low, using his power. I, didn't, I don't think we're going to start coining the phrase Air Harvey very soon. <laughs> well, the turbo jet didn't kick in on that play. No, good penetration by the Auburn defense, though. Fourth and goal, two tight ends. No way. The defense holds. surprising that Georgia would try the second play. Garrison Hurst is the guy you should go to. He's been in the end zone 17 times this year. And that ball does not get over the end zone. It's a great play by the Auburn defense. Penetration. The linebackers met him up high. And Auburn takes over on their one-inch line. Willis, a name we've heard a lot of this afternoon. And Randy Hart led the charge of defender. First and ten deep in their own territory. 
They make a little room for themselves on first down. That was Bostic. Gained close to two yards. But what a stand by that Auburn defense. Well, for Georgia right now, if they can get in a situation where they can force Auburn to punt, they should get the ball in great field position. Obviously, Auburn is going to try and punch it out, maybe take a chance with a pass play here. They don't want to spend a lot of time in the end zone. They don't want to run a waggle or anything, but they have two tight ends right now, which is formation they run this from. It's a one-back set. 6.25 remaining in the second quarter. Run it out to the four-yard line. Bostic again. Well, tomorrow night on ABC, all new episodes of America's Funniest Home Videos and America's Funniest People begin an hour earlier at 7, 6 Central. Then the television event of the year. Look inside music's most mysterious family, the Jackson 5. Tomorrow, the Jacksons on ABC. Mark, that kind of looked like you on the dance floor there. Well, it was like one the of their songs, huh? <laughs> the other MJ, the, the real thriller. Stan White out of the end zone. Looking up top and into the stands, into the net. Well, he did a very smart thing right there. He had pressure on him. It would have been a two-point safety against Auburn. He got rid of the football. Nobody was open. What he didn't want to do there, and Stan White is throw an interception or turn the ball over or give up points. So Auburn has to stand. Now they try and punt themselves at the decent field position and see if the defense can hold again. Good pressure that time coming from Mitch Davis. As Daniel is standing nine yards deep. Three punts so far, averaging 42 yards per punt this afternoon. His longest was 48. It's off a decent but returnable kick at midfield. Hastings fumbles it. Hastings tackled back at the 44 by Chris Schelling. Great punt by Daniel. Got them out of a big hole. Absolutely. But Georgia still with good field position as they lead 7 to nothing. We'll be back at Jordan Air Stadium after this. It's flashback time as we turn the dial back to 1982. This traditional rivalry saw two of the best college football runners of all time, Herschel Walker and that man Bo Jackson. Georgia won the game 19 to 14. Well, Pat Dye and the University of Auburn received their NCAA letter of inquiry November the 5th, and it has been trouble ever since. They have a minimum of 90 days to respond. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Nice defensive play by that Tiger defense, and Willis, again, the prominent player, tackled Garrison Hurst. That's right, Mark. Great play by James Willis, but to continue discussion about Pat Dye. At least in one respect, the rumor and innuendo has ended, and now there are nine specific allegations. The university has three months to respond to them, and at least at that point, the facts will be borne out, and the NCAA can choose to respond to it in any way they want to. If it's sanctions or penalties, they can do that. Zaire hands it off to Garrison Hurst, and Hurst is over midfield down to the 49-yard line. You know, we talked with head coach Pat Dye yesterday, and uh, We'll let you know about some of his thoughts a little bit later in the show. But the most damaging of the infractions named was that there was a lack of institutional control as well as the claim that head coach Pat Dye and assistant coaches knew about the illegal payments going to the players. And how the NCAA rules on that will ultimately determine Pat Dye's fate. Third down and seven. Pardon me, third down and four. Zaire going to Hastings and it's picked off. Chris Schelling with the pick. Hastings is getting a lot of double coverage all day. Earlier, the free safety and he battled for the ball. That was Clarence Moore, but this time Chris Schelling comes across. Makes a terrific interception. Actually, it wasn't uh, Schellings. Yes, it was. Number four, Chris Schellings playing underneath as a strong safety breaks on the football, makes a terrific play. On first down, Stan White now completes it. 
to Thomas Bailey. And Bailey is at the 48th. First down, Tigers. The tackle by Chris Wilson. Thomas Bailey's return to the Auburn lineup is really helping Stan White, too. He had a broken jaw and missed two games earlier in the season. Of course, whenever you have a broken jaw, you lose your strength. You can't eat right. So he's finally coming into his own, and he's, he's certainly helping the Auburn offense. That's yeah, tough to live on soup through a straw, isn't it? Oh, God, it is. Ted Yarbrough now in the basket for Auburn. And he gets the carry. And he's tackled at the 49-yard line. Well, tomorrow... ABC Sports travels to the tropical paradise of Maui, Hawaii. Mike Stanley, the Masters champion, Fred Couples, and the PGA Tour's best shoot for the title in the final round of the Lincoln Mercury Kapalua International. Live coverage begins at 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central, and Pacific tomorrow here on ABC. Second down and nine for Auburn. White to pass. And he runs out of the pocket and out of bounds at the 47. Didn't really look like he had a man open there. No, he did not, and he got out of bounds. He's chased by Randall Godfrey, number 42, the freshman who many people in Georgia think will, by his senior year, wind up to be the best linebacker in the history of the school. He has 4 or 5 speed, the 39 and a half inch vertical jump. I think he has a 10 600 meter record and just a fabulous athlete. You're finding more of these great athletes playing in the inside linebacker positions now, too, in college football. And a lot of this game is about recruiting rights and recruiting boundaries. Bostic, lots of real estate. James Bostic. A pickup of 29 yards. That play barely worked. Number 92 will flash in the screen after Bostic makes the catch there. And actually, uh, Bostic is able to slip a tackle. He picks up some blocks downfield. And he's the big play guy. He's the horse for this Auburn offense. There he breaks some tackles on his own. is able to get deep into Georgia territory. And oh, how that turnover has turned things around. This drive started deep in their own territory. Bostic now over the 20 down to the 19. It's up three yards, tackled by Casey Barnum, who was injured earlier and has now returned to the ball game. I wonder if Ray Goff now is starting to reconsider his decision. He could have gone up 10-0. Of course, it did get him seven points earlier in the first quarter, but now with Auburn driving, saying, I'm sure he'd rather have the field goal and be up 10-0 at this point. But that's what our job is, to second-guess these guys. <laughs> Auburn on the move. Second down and eight. Looks like he's checking off at the line of scrimmage. Three wide receivers in. Into the end zone. And incomplete, intended for Orlando Parker. Parker, one of the real speed guys from the receiving position. That he is, and he had a step on the defender on that play. It was Al Jackson in coverage, number two. Stan White laid it up there, and that's a safe pass. Take a shot in the end zone. That pass can't be uh, intercepted, or, or, or the only thing that bad can happen is an incompletion. Stan White used his head there, laid it up over the top. You've got a track guy running for it, and apparently Orlando Parker has now broken Bo Jackson's 60-yard indoor dash record here at Auburn, so he's the kind of guy to run under a pass like that. They're going to make some big plays like Bo. Stan White completes it. Back to Parker, and Parker could score. Pushed out of bounds at the three. That's a 17-yard gain for Parker, and that's a mismatch. Mike Jones, number nine, winds up covering Parker. Mike Jones is a strong safety. He shouldn't be isolated on a wide receiver. One-on-one, -on -one, once Parker breaks the tackle, he's able to get down to the four-yard line. He's had some trouble holding on to some footballs this year. But that time he made a nice catch, John. That he did. As a track player, it's often difficult to make that conversion into football, but he's doing it better and better. He's dropping balls, but he's also making big plays like he did just there. We're going to take a short break with Auburn in scoring position. Stick around. Yesterday, it was the Burn the Bulldog Parade held annually on the day before the game. 
Fraternities and sororities build floats made out of edible food and parade them from the eagle's cage to the drill field where the pep rally is held and the floats are burned. First and ten. The full house backfield was set up and Bostic on first and goal got down to the one and a half. The tackle made by Ledbetter. Bostic in the middle of the T formation there. They had three backs in the backfield, two tight ends. They handed off to him. That ball's getting kicked around a little bit. I don't think the officials noticed that. That ball was just kicked by a Georgia defender. They lost about a half a yard right now. Full house backfield again, two tight ends, second and goal. Bostic. Touchdown, Auburn. Second effort there by Bostic on that play. I'm not sure. We'll watch the replay. I am not sure he got an assist from Joe Frazier. Not necessarily legal, Mark. That's right. You can't help a running back out, and as Bostic was struggling on the goal line, he got an assist from Joe Frazier. We'll take a look at it after the extra point. Hey, they'll take it any way they can get it as they score the touchdown with 104 remaining in the first half of play. Etheridge with the extra point to not the game at seven apiece. And oh, how this game has turned. Georgia knocking on the door. They can go up 14-0. They don't now. Auburn ties it up at seven all. The Tigers still hoping to make it into the bowl picture. Tie the game at seven apiece. They have a full house backfield. Good block by the tight end on the right side. Watch Joe Frazier, number five. Help is running back, get the ball in the end zone. That is illegal. Auburn got away with it. He'll take the assist. Here's Hastings at the goal line. Hastings out to the 21-yard line with 57 seconds to go in the first half of play. Well, time permitting, stay tuned for the thrifty car rental post-game report featuring scores and highlights from across the country as well as the Prudential halftime report. John Saunders with scores and highlights from a very busy Saturday afternoon in college football, as well as an interview with Greg Hill, the great running back from Texas A&M, their team winning on Thursday night against Houston. Still time to get into field goal position for Georgia. Here's Hurst. Hurst out to the 25, and the clock keeps moving. What do you do here, John, if you're Georgia? I think, I think what they wanted to do was burst, burst through, try and get 10 yards or more, and get a little better field position, and then take some shots in field goal range. And I think they'll try and throw a pass here and get a first down. I mean, Zaire is a good quarterback. They have a good passing game. There's no reason why they shouldn't try some safe passes here toward the sideline to see if they can get field goal range. Well, Hastings is split to the wide side of the field, and they hand it off to Harvey. Harvey out to the 37, and he got rocked. The clock stops with 14 seconds to play in the first half. Anthony Harris and Chris Schelling made the tackle. Now Georgia only has one timeout left, but now they're at the 37-yard line almost. But the clock is winding, and they're choosing not to use the timeout. Well, there's actually no need to even run a play if they choose not to. And I don't think they will. Now they're going to let it run out. And Pat Dye has to feel good about this first half of play. His defense really held at a crucial time. Absolutely right. Ray Goff heading off the field with a 7-7 tie. Halftime activities in a moment. The financial strength of the rock. The Prudential. Rock solid. From New York, John Saunders. Welcome those of you watching the games in the Big Ten and the Southeastern Conference. We'll get back to the second half in just a moment, but first it's time for the Prudential Halftime Report. And we'll start off with the number one team in the nation. They were off last week. Well, they probably could have taken this week off as well. They blow out Temple 48 to nothing. Gino Toretta, well, his Heisman chances are getting even better. Toretta completes a three-yard touchdown pass to Kevin Kirkheide. Miami with a 34-0 lead. Toretta for a Heisman campaign in full swing. Prior to that, though, a little humor. Toretta to Horace Copeland, who thinks he has a touchdown, gets up and does a flip. Officials, though, are saying no touchdown. So Keith Crispina, Crispina rather, does a flip of his own. 9.5 on both of them. 
48 to nothing is the final there. Gino Toretta, 16 of 23, 221 yards and two touchdowns before he came out of the game. 122 straight attempts without an interception. New Miami record. Illinois and Michigan. This was the exciting one of the day thus far. You saw it earlier here on ABC. How about five straight Big Ten championships? Well, Tyrone Wheatley says maybe not. Fumbles early. Jesse Johnson fumbles on his way to the goal line. And Elvis Gerbach, his pass is dropped by Derek Alexander. Gary Moore had reason for concern. They had four turnovers early in the game. Fourth quarter, Illini takes the lead. Jesse Verdusco goes in. Punches it across from a couple of yards out. Then Elvis Gerbach rallies Michigan, hooks up with Derek Alexander. Michigan approaches midfield, two minutes to go. Then they get conservative. Jesse Johnson under a minute for the six-yard loss. Maybe Moeller's thinking about the Rose Bowl because this is all he needs for the ticket to the Rose Bowl. The 40-yard field goal ties the game at 22 apiece, and that's where it winds up. 22 each. Michigan's 19-game Big Ten win streak, though, is stopped. But Michigan headed to the Rose Bowl. Washington, if they win their last two, they're in. Arizona does not control its own destiny. Washington State, if they win their last two, they do control their own destiny. Washington underway right now against Oregon State. Mark Brunel with a one-yard touchdown pass and has one rushing as well. They're bowling out Oregon State thus far. 24 to nothing is the score there. USC and Arizona. Some of you watching this here on ABC. 6 nothing. Estrus Creighton with a two-yard touchdown run for USC, missing the point after. Florida State, 139 points scored in their last two weeks, 69 last week, 70 this week as they blow out Tulane. The game's not over. It's in the fourth quarter, just about one minute to go. Nebraska loses to Iowa State. This is the same Nebraska team that blew out Colorado, blew out Kansas, and now Nebraska will still be headed to the Orange Bowl unless they lose to Oklahoma or Kansas State. Then the winner of Kansas-Colorado would go if they win their remaining games. Penn State and Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, get a two-point conversion from Jerome Bettis and win 17-16. to Syracuse and Boston College, some of you watching this one here on ABC. Marvin Graves with a three-yard touchdown run. Georgia and Auburn also tied 7-7, also an ABC game. Garrison Hurst has a one-yard touchdown run there. Colorado and Kansas, I said the winner of this game could be headed to the Orange Bowl, depending what happens with Nebraska the rest of the way. Chip Hillary has run one in for Kansas. Ohio State and Indiana also here on ABC. 3-0 is the score. Tim Williams, a 24-yard field goal, is the only scoring of the game. Tennessee, Johnny Majors, one of his last few games. They're leading over Memphis State, 20-14. We reported earlier today, Johnny Majors has stepped down as the head coach of Tennessee after 16 years, basically was forced out, says he would still like to coach. Some other games we're watching tonight, Washington State and Stanford. Alabama and Mississippi State, and Hawaii and San Diego State. Let's take a look at the Kapalua leaderboard. Mike Stanley leading by a stroke. This is during a round three. To more, you can see final round action from Kapalua in Maui. Back with more on the Prudential Halftime Report in just a moment. But first, to listen to the Indiana Band, to look at some more scores for around the nation. Once again to New York in the Prudential Halftime Report, I'm John Saunders. Let's roll along with the scores and the highlights. Florida with a scare against South Carolina. Steve Tannehill, 4-0 as a starter, said he'd never lose the rest of this year. But he gets sacked here by Carlton Miles, and that finally gets the offense rolling for Florida. Shane Matthews comes on, gives to Eric Rett, back to Matthews, and he hits Jack Jackson. This sets up a Matthews one-yard touchdown run. 7-3, to Florida gets on the board. And then Matthews hooks up with Aubrey Hill. 36 yards this one covers as he hauls it in. He's open to the end zone for the touchdown. 14-9 is the final Florida wins. It's 18th straight at Florida Field. So in the SEC, there's a tie atop the standings right now. But should it end that way, Florida would go to the SEC championship game because they beat the Dogs earlier this year. In the ACC, Duke and NC State. Spence Fisher had a tough day today. Intercepted here by Damian Covington. He also fumbled one that ended up as a touchdown. 28 yards on this one as NC State rolls 45-27. to Their defense has scored five touchdowns in the last three games. 
Brown will lose it to Dartmouth. Jay Fielder, two touchdown passes for Dartmouth there, 51 to 28. Columbia beats Cornell. That's one and seven coming in, beating seven and one. Des Worthman, 16 tackles on defense. Kicked two point afters, rushed for two touchdowns, scored a two point point after, and recovered a fumble. He goes both ways. Princeton over Yale, 36 to seven. Keith Elias, 20 carries, 140 yards. So in the standings, Dartmouth and Princeton will meet next week for the Ivy League title. Southern Mississippi, a one-point winner over Virginia Tech. This one, a surprise at the end as Lance Nations kicked a 22-yard field goal, their third win on our last second field goal. Maryland blows out Clemson, same team that blew out North Carolina a week ago was Clemson. Marcus Badgett, two touchdown passes, or catches rather, in that one. John Kaleo, 27 of 41, 418 yards and five touchdowns. That's a record. Mike Green with three field goals for Wake Forest as they beat Georgia Tech 23 to 10. Their sixth win in a row. Michigan State all over Purdue 35 to 13. Craig Thomas 15 carries, 127 yards and two touchdowns. Bowling Green and Ball State. Bowling Green ties a Mid-American Conference record with their 16th straight conference win. Now on Thursday the game was between Texas A&M and Houston and Greg Hill had another terrific game. Three touchdowns rushing, including this one where he scoots into the end zone going to the left and then to the right. We spoke with Greg Hill earlier today, and we wondered if that undefeated A&M team felt they were getting no respect. Well, it's not necessarily that we feel that we're not getting any respect. It's that, you know, we're, we're playing hard every game and and, uh, and we're winning every game, but I understand that uh, being in the, in, in, the, in the top five that you need to win your games convincingly, and we, we've been winning, and, and for me, that's fine to win. A win is a win no matter how you how you put it, but, uh, you know, I guess we're not playing uh, good enough for you guys to uh, move us up in the polls. Oh, wait a second. I don't get to move you up. If I did, maybe I would. In the Heisman race, here's another thing that's very interesting to me. You're the fastest player ever to get to 2,000 yards in Southwest Conference history, yet we hear about Garrison Hurst. We heard about Marshall Falk and Gino Toretta. We don't hear that much about Greg Hill. Why do you feel that is? Well, I, I, I'm not for sure because... Uh, I, I play hard every week, and, 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 it, it, and, it, and I'm not worried about it. Uh, I'm just going out to play ball for my team. And, uh, and those guys there, I, I love to watch Garrison Hurst and uh, Marshall Falk on TV. So I can, I can pretty much understand why, you know, everybody puts the focus on those guys because those, those guys, every time they touch a ball, it, it, it's, uh, it's almost apparent that they can score a touchdown. Very quickly, do you see a scenario where possibly Alabama loses, Michigan loses, and we have Texas A&M against Miami in the Cotton Bowl? Oh, it's a possibility. You know, that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, I prayed about it uh, <clears throat> last night after our game, and uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, Jackie Sherrill will be out there uh, playing for not only his team but playing for the other Aggies that he has back in uh, in Texas. Trying to help you guys out a little bit. All right, next week you have TCU. Good luck in that game. Thanks for joining us. Texas A&M still undefeated. We should remind you, coming up next week, another doubleheader here on ABC. We'll start it at noon Eastern time. Michigan and Ohio State, always a tremendous matchup. And then at 3.30 Eastern time, Miami and Syracuse in the Big East. Washington and Washington State in the Pac-10. Southwest Conference or the Western Athletic. Back with more in just a moment. I'm Mark Jones, along with John Spagnola. We're back in the house, getting set for the start of the third quarter. The score is headlocked at 70. He's going to kick it off, and Brian Karkowska will be doing the honors. Back deep, Andre Hastings, standing on his own goal line. And Garrison Hurst joins him on the left pass. This will be Hastings on the goal line. Up the middle, and he's out to the 23. And that's where Eric Zire will take over. Zire, pretty good in the first half, but he did force that one pass in there too much. Seven of nine, 85 yards, and one critical interception, which led to an Auburn score. That was his 11th interception of the year. He only had four all of last year. And for a sophomore quarterback, 11 interceptions is not too bad in your 10th game, but he set such a high standard last year as a freshman playing quarterback that uh, some people are a little bit critical of his decision-making so far this year. And also, I guess the element of surprise has disappeared as well. That is usually the case. There's a delay on the field. We have a malfunction with the clock. 
no time expired on the kickoff is what happened. So come to Auburn, Alabama, you will see time stand still, literally. <laughs> At least 10 seconds of it anyway. You know, thinking about when this uh, rivalry started back in 1892, the Georgia team took the old railroad and the passenger list read like an Athens Society column. T.W. Reed, C.M. Snellings, Sheriff J.W. Weir, and the fire captain, W.O. Farrar. A lot of old timers on I that. wonder what they used for a clock back then. Probably <laughs> sand crystals. Let's take a look at the statistics from halftime. Well, the turnovers are even, the game's even at 7-all. The total yards is pretty close, and Auburn awakened in the second quarter with 77 yards passing the screenplay to James Bostick, of course. The big play, that was good for 30 yards, and that was a pretty nice drive by Auburn. They moved the ball around, they ran the ball effectively, uh, they mixed the pass in nicely, and uh, now the game is all tied at 7-all. We've got a terrific game in nope. the 100th anniversary of this much, much storied series. Now, what does Auburn do to maintain that productivity offensively? Well, to them, the field position battle is very important, and I'm sure they'd like to see if they can get another turnover. Well, they took seven seconds off the clock, and it's first and ten Georgia at the 23. Zaire on play action. Has a lot of time and hits his receiver at the 31-yard line. That was Jeff Thomas with his first reception of the afternoon, and cool hand Eric with a nice pass there. Well, Zaire actually went all across the field. Hastings on the left side, Mitchell the tight end in the middle, came back to the short side of the field and found Jeff Thomas. Eric Zaire completing 57% of his passes coming into this contest. Thomas now, split to the top of your screen. That's Hastings going in motion. Garrison Hurst. Now there you see some of the toughness of Garrison Hurst running it inside and up to the 37-yard line. Known for his speed, but he's a pretty strong guy too, John. Uh, it was a great run, but it was even a better lead block by Frank Harvey on James Wills. Watch the fullback and watch the linebacker collide here. Harvey wins that battle, a nice lead block. And Garrison Hurst breaks it up into the middle for a first down. Now that's the kind of thing Harvey should have done, and honestly, that's the kind of play Georgia probably should have run on that fourth down play. Let Harvey block, let Harrison go over the top for the touchdown. Hurst now, 20 rushes for a total of 65 yards. Sire to pass, looking up top. That's Thomas, and it's out of bounds. Good coverage that time by Calvin Jackson, the freshman. Those 5'10", 167 pounds. Stride for stride that time with Andre. Well, a couple of eights going after it there on the far sideline, and Thomas ran it out and up. Calvin Jackson saw it all the way and, and played it very well. And a really good coverage by Calvin Jackson on that particular play. You look at the secondary of Auburn, very, very young. That is true. Clarence Martin started today. He's, you know, he's a senior, and uh, he's been out for a couple of games. They have all sophomore and freshman starting at corners and at the uh, strong safety position. Second down and 10. Hurst in motion to the short side of the field. Oh, well, they have Hurst. Complete! And Hurst, and Hurst is going to take it in the house for a touchdown! 64 yards and a strike and a touchdown. That is a play which Georgia ran earlier today, but they ran the football and out of this particular foil, and Hurst goes in motion. Fred Smith is in coverage on him downfield. And Hurst just runs it out and up. And the only guy who could make the play was number six, Fred Smith. This was a great play for Georgia because they ran the same formation in motion earlier and ran the football. This time they threw off of it and paid a big dividend for him. Peterson with the extra point, and John Zyre that time really appeared to look off the safety just long enough to hold him off. That's exactly what happened on that play, too. Zyre deserves some credit for completing that pass as well. So Georgia takes a seven-point lead. We'll take a break when we come back. Well, Garrison Hurst always uh, seems to attract crowds, even if it's his own teammates. <laughs> he got a touchdown, and now he's only two touchdowns shy of Herschel Walker's single-season touchdown record. Uh, despite all the publicity he's received, he really gets along with his teammates well. Peterson with the kick. That's Alex Smith. 
And Smith tripped up nicely at the 20-yard line that time by number 30, Will Muschamp. Backup free safety. So now it's the Tigers' turn. Starting quarterback Stan White has gone the distance. Led the team downfield nicely towards the end of the first half of play. And they cashed in with a touchdown. We're just underway here in the third quarter. 13.56 remaining. And it's 14-7. to Bostic and Richardson line up for Auburn in the eye. White, a strike to Bailey. Move the sticks. First down at the 36. A pickup of 15 yards. The tackle by Mike Jones. Good pass protection. Allowed Mike Bailey to run an in route. The linebackers are held by the play action pass. He comes back across the middle. What I like about him is he really squared that pattern off. He didn't drift upfield. That can get a receiver in trouble. Nice reception by Thomas Bailey. A soft spot over the middle there. Well, when those linebackers step up, you'll have that. First down. And it gives us to Bostic. This time he's tripped up behind the line of scrimmage. Back at the 36. Pat Dye has been under heavy fire. And we asked him a couple of days ago how he would like to see things resolved with the NCAA. Here's what he had to say. I regret it ever happened. And, uh, you know, that would, that's about the extent that I can comment on it, really. Uh, it's not any fun, and been foul people, and certainly not for me and the players. Well, they're going for big fun here downfield to the speedster, Orlando Parker, and it's incomplete. Mike Jones, the safety, came over for help. Good Perfect. coverage with Auburn taking a shot there. You know, Pat Dye is no stranger to this series. He played for Georgia. Uh, he was part of the 1959 team. He played offensive guard. And actually, Georgia was losing to Auburn last drive by Georgia. And there was a fumble on the play on the drive. Pat Dye recovered the fumble. France Arkansas was a quarterback for Georgia at the time. Led the team into the end zone. They won the game 14-13. And went on to play in the Orange Bowl. So a lot of these coaches have been through this series before. Yeah, Ray Goff as well. The pass is complete this time to Orlando Parker at the 38-yard line. He's tackled right there by Al Jackson. So the Georgia defense holds 1-2-3 kick for Auburn. We talked about Pat Dye being a player in that series. Well, Ray Goff also played in the series. That he did. He was quarterback, and they didn't even throw the football that day. He was the quarterback in a 28-0 win back in 1975. Oh, boy. If I were him, I'd try and change those media guys. Doctor some of those statistics. Hastings driven back to the 90 footballs. Terry Solomon put a big hit on Hastings, and he was very fortunate, John, to get that ball back. That he was another terrific punt by Terry Daniel. Georgia pin deep when we come back. Here's Abby, the Auburn mascot, setting fire to the first float at the Burn the Bulldog pep rally. The centennial celebration representing 100 years of football culminated the rally. Looks like the 4th of July. Well, I asked Pat Dye how the NCAA letter of inquiry has affected his team. And we'll tell you what he said after this play. First out to the nine, where he's tackled by the linebacker, Anthony Harris and Willie Whitehead, the left end. Georgia in pretty tough field position because Andre Hastings, who has not made good decisions today, returning punts, he almost had a safety. He missed one at midfield, fumbled out, and this one he dropped two and almost turned the ball over. Andre having his problems today, punt returning. Usually sure-handed, too. The toss to Hurst. Hurst trying to square those shoulders and turn the corner, but he was... Rudely roughed up and bunched out of bounds at the 11-yard line by Morton and Karakin Cunningham. Actually, Cunningham is a very good outside linebacker. He's a senior on this unit. He's kind of a renaissance man, too. You know, he's uh, 
pre-med student and plays the piano and he's playing outstanding defense this year for Auburn. Well, that defense needs a little medicine right now, John. <laughs> and some music as well. Right? Yeah. Play a good song. But here's Eric Zier. Completes it to a wide open Paul Etheridge. And Etheridge has the first down at the 32-yard line. Man, was he open. A 20-yard pickup. Paul Etheridge, a little used tight end. Big target at 6'6", 240. Eric Zier, once again, we've seen him do this a couple times today. Really scan the field, and when he has that extra time, he's able to find Etheridge out on the sideline. And there's basically a blown coverage or a coverage that, that loses its ability to cover because the quarterback has so much time. Ball is spotted at the 31-yard line on first and 10. Hurst in motion. They toss it to Harvey. Cuts it back nicely, lowers his hat, and is out near another Georgia first down. So they're churning up real estate now on the ground. Shelling made the tackle. Well, tomorrow, the PGA Tour's best hit the links for the final round of the Lincoln Mercury Kapalua International. Live from Maui, Hawaii, tomorrow on ABC Sports. Good blocking there from the offensive line for Harvey to get the first down, and Garrison Hurst in motion also made a nice block. I made a comparison to Hurst with uh, Walter Payton earlier. It's because of his ability to block and catch the ball that makes him uh, very comparable to Walter Payton. Some running backs don't like to pay the price unless they're carrying the ball. Not the case with Hurst. Here's Harvey now out to the 46-yard line, tackled by James Willis, whose name we've said a lot this afternoon. That'll be a first down. Good blocking by the offensive line up front. Jack Swan, the center, makes a nice block, is able to turn the nose in. Number 79 makes a nice block as well. That's Steve Roberts. And when you can get that kind of production up front, make first downs, it makes your offensive pumping a lot easier. You get to be a lot smarter coach. Now this makes you a dumb coach. <laughs> That's Alec Millen, who we thought was not going to play today because he had a knee problem, so he's setting it up. And Illegal procedure on the line against the offense. Be five yards. Repeat the down. The eyes of Alec Millen say it all. He is one of the more intense members of that squad. In fact, his coaches say he's a bit of a wild man. <laughs> well, you know, in college, they don't call the number out if they're going to play like that. <laughs> they really don't need to. They move it back five yards. First down and 15. Harvey and Hurst in the eye. This is Garrison Hurst trying to cut it back. And he'll lose two yards. Cunningham with the tackle along with Luster. Good read by Cunningham again. He's a very hedgy player, not terribly big. He's able to read that particular play, and, and Hurst is having his trouble today. They, the Auburn defense has done a pretty nice job containing him in the running game. Of course, he had the 64-yard reception for a touchdown, which is, which is his career-long, eclipsing a 63-yarder earlier this year. Well, he catches it, and he runs it. And now they face second down and long, 18 to go. First in motion to the short side. Zyre rocked and sacked at the 32. Anthony Harris on the big hit. Zyre was looking for Hurst again. He went, Hurst went in motion. He's forced up field, and Harris is there. As soon as Zyre stepped up, it was all over. Oh, man, he hit him like a search warrant. <laughs> FBI never stuff. One. Never heard that one before. <laughs> he was the most improved linebacker coming out of spring practice. Harris, boy, that's a linebacker's dream right there to be able to hit a quarterback like that. Third and Montgomery to go. Here's Hurst. Garrison Hurst. A shoestring tackle at the 48-yard line, or else he may have gotten the first down. As it is, he falls 10 yards short. Clarence Morton with the tackle. Morton saved the first down on that play. No question about it. At this point, Georgia doesn't want to turn the ball over. They don't want to force the situation where uh, they turn the ball over, throwing the football. But when you give the guy like Hurst the football, Fortunately, Morton was there to make the play, and Georgia's forced to punt. Well, Cunningham almost got away with what seemed to be a face mask in practice. Fair catch called at the 18-yard line by Thomas Bailey. 
We have 7.35 remaining in the third quarter of play. Ray Goff against Pat Dye in this storied rivalry. Come on back. And the Georgia Bulldogs needing a win today. If they entertain hopes of playing in that SEC championship game on December the 5th, as it is, first and 10 for Auburn, and Bostic runs it around the right side and is down to the 18-yard line, tackled by Ledbetter. I don't think there's any question that Pat Dye is more than saddened by the allegations against his program, and I asked him if and when it has affected his team. Here's what he had to say about it. You know, I haven't noticed any uh, any significant difference in their work habits on the field, and uh, you know, it's been around so long now. Until you know, I don't think it had that big an impact. On Bostic on this carry, and he's tackled back at the 22-yard line that time. Pardon me, the 17. Wallace and Godfrey in on that stop. Big defensive surge by two plays in a row now by Georgia. They're going to force Auburn to throw the football here in a third and long situation. Auburn wants to get back in this ball game. They're down by seven, and they're going to have to convert some first downs, or it'll start to get a little serious here pretty soon. Third down and 11. 6.22 remaining. White out of the backfield to Bostic, but far short of the first down. Do you like the call, John? Actually, I do. It was a safe pass. I, but I, the question I always have is, why do they throw the backs out of the I formation? It takes so much longer for a back to get into the secondary out of the I formation. I'd rather see him throw out of a split back formation. And if that was the case, Bostic may have been able to get upfield a little farther and convert a first down. But that's what you see a lot in college football, and both teams do that. Well, they end up three yards short of the first down. Terry Daniel into punt. Hastings, who's had trouble holding on to kickoffs as well as punts this afternoon, is on his own 30. A low, long line drive back to the 22. Hastings weaving a little magic out to the 40-yard line. A nice return of 18 yards after that 53-yard punt by Daniel. The tackle made by Terry Solomon, and that time, Hastings held on to the ball. He did. Well, that ball was almost like a pass. It was a low spiral that hit him right in the chest. And uh, I think he's uh, certainly concerned about the way he's been handling punts so far today. He really made sure of that one. Now, Florida finally stopped that juggernaut called South Carolina. The Gamecocks losing for the first time in five games, 14 to 9. People in Georgia were watching that one closely. Screaming. The bats in the offset eye. Hastings in the slot. And that's Garrison Hurst. One, two, three, four tackles were broken before he was brought down at the 47-yard line. The tackle by Tim Cromarty. That's just terrific feet. There really wasn't a whole lot there. We have a good running back with great feet. He's able to pick his feet up and get through the hole. There wasn't much of a hole there. He pretty much made that run entirely on his own. Give Cromarty credit for a defensive lineman to come back and make the tackle from the defensive line position. These Auburn players are hustling today. Well, they've been relied upon a lot. They've been on the field a lot this afternoon. Garrison Hurst tackled by James Quick Willis. And a fumble. And now I think the officials are going to rule that Hurst was tackled at the 40. Actually, it was Alonzo Etheridge, number 91, who made penetration and got through on that play, Mark. And there are a lot of people feel that that was a fumble. Yeah, about 80,000 of them, huh? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe just, just under 80,000. <laughs> Alonzo Etheridge gets quick penetration there. Hurst tries to cut it back. Let's see if the ball comes out. Now his progress is stopped. That's not a fumble. Good no call by the officials. Third down and seven now. Play action. Under pressure. Complete to Thomas. And Thomas has a Georgia first down at the 40-yard line. Pardon me, that's Hassan Graham. A pickup of 17 yards. 
Graham, a junior college transfer, one of six on this Georgia team. He's one of the 50-plus club. Zyers rolling out to him at the curl pattern zone coverage. He's able to get a big enough push downfield to turn the cornerback around. That's Calvin Jackson on the coverage. When you can get that kind of push and come back to the football, it creates that cushion in which Zyer could see and throw a nice pass to complete that. George is starting to operate pretty well now offensively. And Wayne McDuffie said coming into this game, the offensive coordinator, he wasn't happy with his receivers other than Hastings, but they've done a good job. That they have. Going up top now. And it's underthrown and intercepted. Calvin Jackson. That ball was underthrown badly. Look at the top of your screen. Hassan Graham, good coverage by Calvin Jackson. But look how badly the ball is underthrown. And Jackson has good position. That's the second interception today for Zaire. Auburn was able to capitalize on the first one. Let's see what they do. Unfortunately, they've got the poor field position again. Calvin Jackson, good coverage. And you've seen Georgia do that today. They, they go to a receiver once and they go back to him on a big play. Neither one has worked. They tried it with Hastings earlier. Auburn starting on its own one-yard line. And there are flags down on the field. <laughs> and the center, ever. Greg Thompson, got his world rock, too. Oh, uh, he's going to have to take a little aspirin after this one. It was a free shot. It was a good one, if nothing else. I think it's Casey Burnham. I don't know what made him go on that play. I didn't see any real flinching by the Auburn offensive line, but now it's first and five. Looked like the 7-10 split. He got Thompson as well as the quarterback. He'll change from a 6-foot-2 person to a 6-foot-1 person after that. First and five. And they get the first down out to the 11-yard line. Bostic, the workhorse, out of the backfield. Tom Wallace making the stop that time. Bostic really establishing himself as the number one tailback here. Team's leading rusher. It's an interesting situation. Now you have second and real short. I take a shot deep downfield off play action. I think you can come back and convert the uh, first down on third down if you, if you have an incompletion. This might be an opportunity to use the speed of an Orlando Parker. Let's see if they decide to do that. Well, John Parker is lined up in the slot, and they run the ball, and they get the first down. Tony Richardson, the fullback, is one of his few carries on the day. As I said, it's always good to get those first downs and be conservative, right? <laughs> take, take care of business first, huh? <laughs> Mitch Davis made the tackle on Richardson. One of the keys for this Auburn offense was to kind of neutralize Davis. Do you think they've done that so far today? So far, we've seen Davis make a few plays, uh, really rushing the passer. But other than that, uh, they haven't run at him that much. Uh, he is the most respected player on that front seven. Play action, White, wide open to Richardson. Richardson puts his hat down and gets another first down. That's how you take advantage of Mitch Davis. Mitch Davis was rushing on that play. Similar play that we saw in the first half when they get the ball out to uh, Richardson off a little play action, kind of bootleg action there, and that's what happened on that play. So they moved the sticks again. So Auburn's sticking with their philosophy of attacking Mitch Davis in the passing game and Carlo Butler in the running game. Richardson with two receptions for a total of 35 yards. Good receiver out of the backfield. To the short side of the field, complete to the backup tight end, Sean Malone. Well, next Saturday, it's another action-packed double dip on ABC's College Football, 12 noon Eastern, 9 Pacific. The third-ranked Michigan Wolverines head to Columbus for a classic Big Ten showdown against Ohio State. Then regional action as Miami takes on Syracuse, Washington against Washington State, a Southwest Conference game, as well as a game from the Wild Wild Whack. Next Saturday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern on ABC. And don't forget to call your cable operator for the pay-per-view games in your area. Bostic fumbles it, but he got it back. Number 82, Andy Fuller, pounced on the loose ball and a huge sigh of relief from Pat Dye and his squad. Andy Fuller with the biggest reception today. 
for the Auburn offense. Bostic breaks throw on a real nice run. Andy Fuller's hustling downfield right behind him. Number 82 scoops it in. That's, that's a big catch for Auburn. <laughs> One that won't show up in the stats. No, it won't, but it'll keep that drive going. And it's at the 48 right now with 1.45 remaining in the third quarter. White looking to the wide side of the field over the middle complete. Look what I found. <laughs> Thomas Bailey with an early Christmas present. Hard to believe that a ball can be tipped and still maintain its speed and trajectory toward the intended receiver. But that's exactly what happened on that play. Thomas Bailey living right. Off the play action, White steps back. You see who gets their hands up. I think as the linebacker gets his hands, I can't see the number there, but Bailey's right behind there. And for that ball, I mean, there's so many Georgia defenders around there. Randall Godfrey is the guy who got his hands on it, but Bailey stays with the football. Good concentration. And a first down. White going to the air again and going up top to the speedster Parker. Incomplete. Good coverage by Chris Wilson. Well, they sure are keeping that momentum going, or trying to, John. That they are. They took a shot in the end zone, and this is a play where there was no free safety. You want to take advantage of the speed of Orlando Parker on that play. But White might have been better served. Now watch, there's going to be no free safety in the middle of the field. He could have taken some air out of this ball and moved it to the left side a little bit more and allowed Parker to run under it. He didn't have to throw it all the way downfield as if he was throwing over the top of a free safety. And that comes with experience from the quarterback. And Stan White will learn that as he goes. They fake the inside handoff and wide open is Dorn. First down, Tigers to the 22. Greg Tremble made the tackle. A 19-yard pickup for the backup tight end, Derek Dorn. Well, it's so often the case, momentum in football games. You get a turnover, it does something to you. I mean, that's horrible field position by Auburn, but they know they got it on the strength of a turnover. And look what they've been able to do with this drive so far. Derek Dorn with a second reception, and, and Auburn has used that particular play very successfully all afternoon. That little bootleg action, throw it to the tight end out in the flat. They set up in a trick right formation to the wide side. 50 seconds to go in the third quarter. Bostic tripped up right at the line of scrimmage by the nose guard, Casey Barnum. That just looked like an effort play. It, that it was. Greg Thompson, the center, number 54, is trying to get a cutoff block on the nose tackle. Barnum either had a stun on to that side or he read the play really well. That, that's a terrific play by the nose guard. Time winding down now in the third quarter. As Bailey checks back into the game for Auburn along with Parker. Bailey split to the top of your screen, Parker to the bottom. They get the playoff. White with a lot of time runs it himself. Stand the man close to the first down. I believe he got it. That's the last play of the third quarter. A great fourth quarter coming up. We'll return with more action after this message and a word from our ABC station. I would say it's a little bit wild. Why not? Back at Jordan-Hare Stadium, first down and 10. Bostic. Down to the seven-yard line. Boy, I thought he was going to get a lot more yards than that. Greg Tremble came up and put a wicked hit on him. You know, Greg Tremble's only 5'11", 180 pounds. Boy, does he pack a wallop. Still a five-yard game. That's a great play. That's what you want your free safety to do, be able to fill like that and keep a, a five-yarder from becoming anything more. Bostic is a load himself at 217. Make a lot of comparisons. Uh, Greg Tremble to Ben Smith, now who's an injured cornerback with the Philadelphia Eagles. Bostic, two times. But not as good as the last time. Tackled by Buster Owens. So it sets up third down. And the ball now in the middle of the field in case of a field goal. Well, that was a blitz there by Buster Owens. He came right through there. They just picked the seam. They probably took two gaps and filled them up with players in the defensive front and allowed the free safety to run through there. Buster Owens makes a big play for tackle for a loss. Auburn will have to throw the football here with third and six on the eight-yard line. Parker and Carter as they go on a silent snap. 
It's batted down at the line of scrimmage. Casey Barnum may have gotten one of those huge paws on it. So the drive dies inside the 10-yard line. You like that call? Well, uh, with a short set by a quarterback, it's hard to have separation. They're trying to use a, a stretch-type uh, offense with the receivers heading down towards the back of the end zone, but there's not a lot of room to underrate. Operate. Stan White tried to throw a pass underneath. It was batted down. And really, with that short drop, the linemen were right in his face. And the field gets shorter, of course, down there, too. 25-yard field goal attempt now from Scott Etheridge. He's 21 of 26 on the year. Make that 22 of 27. Etheridge is 38% of the Auburn offense this year in scoring, and that's just about right. <laughs> he has three of the 10 points today. Well, they'll take that three as they narrow the Georgia lead to 14-10. Nighttime slowly descends upon Jordan Hare Stadium. Auburn kicking off. Back deep, Hastings and Hurst. That's Hastings. And he is greeted by a horde of Georgia, pardon me, Auburn tacklers at the 21 yard line. So on Georgia's last possession, John, Eric Zier threw a poor pass which hung up in the air for what seemed like forever, which led to the scoring drive. Two scores for Auburn today. Field goal and a touchdown, both off of interceptions by or from Eric Zier. Well, Georgia has to try and get the crowd out of the game. If they can sustain a drive here, it could hurt the Auburn chances of winning. Harvey and Hurst in the eye. Quick three-step drop thrown behind Hastings. And dangerously close to Calvin Jackson, the cornerback. Boy, that is a dangerous pass to throw all the way across the field and have Calvin Jackson almost pick that thing off. Well, Monday Night Football this week, great matchup in the AFC East. It's Jim Kelly and the Buffalo Bills taking on the Miami Dolphins. And Dan Marino live, 9 Eastern time, 8 Central, 6 Pacific on ABC. Kelly having some troubles with that elbow of his of late. Second down, and Garrison Hurst, rough going, and a fumble. Auburn says they have it. Of course, you expect them to say that. <laughs> Hard to say what happened. Georgia likes to run that toss play into the short side of the field. No tight end offense right now. The tight end split out. They like to run this toss play into the short side of the field. Gasserers cuts in, doesn't have real good ball control there. We see it. Oh, the ball does come out. I think Frank Harvey may have come in and made the uh, made the recovery. That's your fullback helping you out. So two near turnovers on back-to-back -back plays for Georgia. John, they're five of eleven this afternoon on third down conversions. And Garrison Hurst gets the first down and a little more. Tackled by Anthony Harris as the wide crowd is quieted. That's the bread and butter of this offense. Get the ball to Garrison Hurst. Tight end blocks down on the play. Frank Harvey on a nice lead block. They pull the offensive guard around, number 79, Steve Robertson. If Georgia could just give the ball to Hurst and he can make first downs like this. This is all that offense would like to do right now. 28 rushes, 95 yards. He's earned every one of them, too. They have not come easily. Make that 29. And he's out to the 38-yard line. Got about four yards on first down, tackled by Tim Cromartie. You know, you are mentioning Garrison Hurst earlier and how he's been able to maintain extremely humble during all the publicity that he's received over the last four weeks and the coaching staff was telling us it was good that the hype really didn't start until about the fourth week of the season with him that is true in that in that particular case and a guy like him i think just enjoys playing a football game and he has to deal with the publicity and he handles it very well first again turns the corner and is about two yards shy of the first down 
Picked up four on that one. Pushed out of bounds by Cunningham and the quarterback, Fritz Smith. A player of versatility is so good, too, and so strong that as the game drags on, defenders generally will lose a half a step. And a guy like him can turn that short gain into a big gain in this situation. There he seemed to have a burst, whereas the Auburn defense didn't, and he was able to squeeze out a few extra yards. Third and two. Who do you think? It's going to be close. Tackled by Willis, the middle linebacker. And Willis and Hurst share a few words on the turf. This is going to be close. They'll measure it. Watch Hurst. I think he's got to stretch this play a little bit more. He has a double team block by his tight end and left tackle on the left side of the football. But as soon as he gets the ball in his hands, and we'll check the measurement here, Hurst breaks it back. And that's, that's what you talk about, great vision from great running back. When you say stretch. Well, he's got to try the play side hole a little bit more. That allows the defense uh, to maybe overrun the play and create a gap. But uh, hey, he's the Heisman Trophy candidate. What do I know? Hey, he's and he got the first down, so he's getting the job done. Stretched it enough. First down and 10. As we take another look at Well, he gets the ball in his hand and he's already cutting it back. And the play is designed to go over the left side. But great running backs do that. And uh, you, you, when you get a first down, the coach will never question you. Play action, the waggle. And Zyre is tackled back at the 35. The third sack of the afternoon for this Auburn defense. Willie Whitehead and Randy Hart with a heart attack. <laughs> Willie Whitehead pretty pleased with himself. I think it's, this is a pretty good call. I'm surprised that Willie White would be up to this. I mean, George has run the ball. A real nice play action fake by Eric Zier. And he stayed with it. But Willie White kept contained, which he has to do. Got upfield and made the tackle. Hard as well. So Auburn sniffed that thing out. Now they have what they want. They've got George in a second and real long. You really can't fault this Auburn defense for much this afternoon. Second and 18. Play action. Zyre going up top to Hastings. He's open, and it's knocked away nicely by Fred Smith. That is terrific coverage by Fred Smith. Timing his jump, flicking the ball away with his left hand. Hey, you've got a guy like Andre Hastings on you on play action. He is all yours, and Fred Smith reads the play, runs down. Now watch him flick the ball away with his left hand. What great timing. What terrific timing. Terrific play by Fred Smith. John, we saw Zyre hang one up earlier. Do you think that one was underthrown a little bit? I don't think so. I think that ball is put pretty well. It was just good coverage by Fred Smith on that play. Georgia facing third down and long, 18 to be specific. They fake the inside handoff. Zyre completes it at midfield but it's about four yards shy of the first down that was jeff thomas making the catch georgia ran that play earlier today they ran it there jeff thomas probably could have pushed up to the first down marker the way that play is set up there's a lot of time to make it develop there's a play action fake there's a draw fake and everything else desires rolling up that particular instance the receiver jeff thomas should have set up beyond the first down marker well, if you're Auburn, I don't think that Georgia will fake it. They're in good field position to do that, but they hang it up high. Bailey catches it at the 19-yard line. A pooch punt of 31 yards as Ray Goff encourages his troops. We'll be right back. <laughs> well, you know what? The, the custom here is that that... Auburn wins a game, they throw toilet paper all over the tumor's <laughs> joint, and if they lose, they still toilet paper the yeah, that's, that's a tough way to go. <laughs> Dorn complete to the 25-yard line. John, that's a play that you really like. That's a play they've run successfully all day, and Dorn on the reception there. I mean, Georgia has yet to defense this play, and it's smart of Auburn to go to it until they see that Georgia can't stop it, and now they wind up in a second and five situation, which is just what Auburn wanted on this drive. Well, if time permits, stay tuned for the Thrifty Car Rental post-game report, featuring scores and highlights from across the country. Well, this is not a panic drive yet, with 9 minutes and 39 seconds left in the game, but Auburn's got to score on this one, or they'll get the ball maybe one more time. 
Storm got five on first down. The inside handoff to Bostic. And Bostic may have gotten two. I'll tell you something about the importance of this ball game today, other than what it means in the standings. The official attendance, 85,214. The first sellout of the season here at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Uh, recruiting rights, loyalties to the schools, ability to, to one-up the other uh, the other team is all plays into this rivalry between these two teams. It began 100 years ago in Piedmont Field in Atlanta, Georgia. Third and two, White complete and a first down to the near side of the field, out of bounds. At the 34 is Frank Sanders. He really drilled that one in there. He has Frank Sanders' first reception this afternoon, too. He plays some tight end occasionally. They move him around. He's a real good receiver. He runs a simple out. White stands tall in the pocket and delivers a perfect strike to the sideline. Auburn continues their drive here now with 8 minutes and 57 seconds left in the game. Thomas now coming out to the bottom of your screen. They come out in a trips right formation. And they run it to Bostic. Bostic found some room up the middle out to the 40-yard line. Nice pickup of about six or seven. Tackled by Charlie Clemens and Randall Godfrey. Interesting there that Stan White was uh, under center the previous two plays. He operated out of the shotgun. You know, I think on certain plays, they want to maybe hand off a draw or they want to give him good vision and if he has to pass the ball, which he had to do on third down. But, of course, before that, he ran a draw play to Bostic out of the shotgun. But you'll see him go under center and you'll see him work from the shotgun depending on the down and distance. A little confusion now on the Auburn side. Running players in and out, and because of that confusion, Stan White has to call a timeout. With 8.20 remaining in the fourth quarter play. We're going to take a break, but don't go away. Well, it's not quite time to press the panic button, but time to get the job done here for Auburn. Third, pardon me, second down and four. Now, was there contact or wasn't there? The offensive line has a move. <laughs> They're still not, boy, are they trying to make a point to the officials or what? Freeze it. Okay, guys, <laughs> you can move now. Oh. On side, on the defense. Look at this. Enough for a first down. In unison. When you see something like this, I can almost guarantee you that Auburn has gone on the same cadence all afternoon. And all, all Stan White had to do was change it once. You saw how many George, it wasn't one guy for Georgia, it was the entire defensive unit. What a great time to change the cadence up by Stan White. Well, they get the easy first down. The ball is at the 45. Bostic over the right side, a gain of three yards. Right now, let's go back to New York with an update from John Saunders. Mark, Arizona and USC, George Malaulu, the left-hander, slings this one up, looking for Kerry Taylor, who camps underneath and has it to the end zone for the touchdown. They lead 7-6 to six in the fourth quarter. Mark. Well, Arizona trying to avoid the letdown after that huge win last week against Washington. Second down and eight right here at Jordan-Hare Stadium. 7.42 remaining in the ballgame. Stan White. Run for your life right is the play, and he's tackled at the 48-yard line by Charlie Clemens. Auburn trying to get big yardage out of that play. All the receivers were well downfield, 20 or 30 yards or more. Charlie Clemens ran down Stan White. Have to be impressed with the job Stan White has done so far today. He hasn't thrown any interceptions. He's 13 for 20 for 169 yards, making very good decisions as a quarterback. Ben White has uh, matured during the course of the season. Came into the game as a 49 or almost 50% passer. So today, adding to those numbers. Rips left for Auburn. White on the run again. Completes the pass to Parker. First down at the 30 for the Tigers. Parker, the quarterback can buy a little extra time. 
receivers can uncover, and that's what Orlando Parker did on this play. By scrambling around a little bit extra there, Stan White's able to buy some time. A nice throw across his body, too. That is a difficult throw. Linebacker Randall Godfrey was in on coverage there. Charlie Clemens, number 48, cleaned him up for the tackle. But Orlando Parker did a nice job of uncovering in the zone coverage. Stan White did a terrific job of finding him. The track guy showing a little savvy there, getting open. Three receptions, 42 yards, and here's Bostic down to the 22. Greg Jackson and Randall Godfrey made the tackle, but a nice pickup close to the first down. A huge play on the right side of the line. Chris Gray, number 68, the senior offensive tackle, opens up the hole. I don't know if you saw his block, but there was a lot of running room there. That might have been the biggest hole today we've seen for James Bostic in the running game. 5.50 remaining in the fourth quarter. First with over 30 carries, but James Bostic as busy at 25. Richardson, the fullback, gets the first down inside the 20 down to the 18-yard line. And the fans voice their appreciation. We weren't quite sure who's going to start for that offensive line today. And there, Shane Kiesler, number 60, makes a nice block. He's playing at the right guard position. 54, Greg Thompson, the center. These guys are getting after it. They can smell that victory. They can taste that victory. And, oh, this would go a long way for healing some of the wounds that have been opened up this week uh, in the Auburn football program. They had the week off, and they had a lot of time to mull over their future. And it's first and ten, ninth play of the drive. And smartly, he throws it away. And a late flag on the sideline. Bailey got hammered and it might be a personal foul against Georgia. Randall Godfrey came through on the play. Another smart decision by Stan White. He didn't give up the sack. He got rid of the football. Godfrey came through on the blitz, and I think we're going to have a personal foul. I guess Ray Goff's contention is that the ball wasn't catchable. Well, that would be for interference, but for personal foul, it's personal foul. Here's another look at it. We'll see if Bailey on the side. Yeah. We just said, now the ball is way overthrown. And I guess it's a, a shot to the head, which is illegal. That's a personal foul. That's how it was called on that particular play. Brian Moore. Very personal. That was the call against him. And maybe that was Chris Wilson. That was number 16, wasn't it? Chris, Chris Wilson gets the personal foul. Couldn't come at a worse time for Georgia. First down and goal for the Tigers. The ball at the nine. Richardson tripped up at the line of scrimmage and falls forward to the eight-yard line. Casey Barnum and Mitch Davis in on the tackle. Well, field goal does no good here. Auburn has to get it into the end zone. It'll be interesting to see what happens if they are faced with a third down situation or a fourth down situation. But I would say right now, with second and eight, they've got to put the ball in the air two times and see if they can score a touchdown. The ball is on the right hash. And Bailey comes out to the wide side of the field. Let's see if they go to that waggle action. Parker is on the short side of the field. They hand it off to Bostic. Nothing doing up the middle. Say they should have gone to the waggle action on that play. The Georgia defense was up to that play. Great surge up front. All those linebackers are up very close. And it looks like Tom Wallace, number 92, is the first guy to make the hit. But uh, there were several other Georgia Bulldogs right there next to them ready to, to clean up on that particular play. To say they were ready for that one would be an understatement. Third and goal, 11th player of the drive. Can they cash in? into the end zone on the fade pattern. It's intercepted. Al Jackson with a big play in the end zone to snuff the drive. <laughs> Al Jackson just had better position on that play. Dan Weiss trying to throw a corner out to Orlando Parker, using speed once again in the wide side of the field to run under the football. 
But Al Jackson had the body position, and this is when a cornerback becomes a rebounder as he's playing basketball almost. Al Jackson just with the superior position, Orlando Parker could not knock it loose, and no, there's no tie catch there going to the offense. Al Jackson had that all the way. That was Auburn's sixth turnover in the red zone in the last five games. And a crucial one there. Hurst is tackled behind the line of scrimmage, a loss of two, and now, John, the clock becomes a factor, ticking and ticking with 3.38 remaining. Etheridge and Willie Whitehead in on the tackle. Those turnovers, well, turnovers always kill you, but the turnovers in scoring territory in the end zone are particularly painful. I mean, think of it this way. Auburn could have kicked a field goal, been down by one, and they can drive, kick a field goal to win the game. Now they have to drive and score a touchdown in order to win this game. Georgia is going to try not to let them have the football anymore. Second down and 11. Play action. They're going to go to the air or try. Zyre throws it out of bounds, incomplete to the near side of the field. Well, next Saturday, number three, Michigan against Ohio State. Doubleheader action live starting at 12 noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific, and then regional coverage featuring Miami, Syracuse, Washington against Washington State, a game from the Southwest Conference, as well as one from the WAC. Next Saturday on ABC, right here, 304 remaining, and Georgia leads 14 to 10. This Auburn defense has done a stellar job, and this is their most critical juncture. Time to get busy and get with the program. Georgia looks confused offensively. They didn't line up right. Zyre's forced to use a timeout. It's really of no consequence because the clock was already stopped with the incompletion. Well, there's a timeout on the field. As Zyre and Goff and the coaching staff talk it over, and as they take a timeout, so will we. We'll be back after you give us the break. Third down and 11 for Georgia. Auburn needs a stop. Sacked. The fourth one of the afternoon for Auburn. James Willis gives his team another chance here. One thing Eric Zier did not want to do is force the football downfield. He play action pass, but by this time, hey, people are already in his face. Tim Romarty, 61, gets a piece of him. He's actually the first guy to touch Eric Zier. And, and the coverage downfield is great, and boy, as well as fired up. And Pat Dye is on the field arguing with one of the officials. He was pointing in the direction of the game clock. We're not exactly sure what happened, but Dye had something to argue about. Well, there were over three minutes left. And now there's two minutes and 42 seconds left, and you have to wonder if uh, a little more time clicked off there than it should have. <laughs> it shouldn't happen at home, though. No, exactly. I was just going to say that. But this one looks like it'll go down as one of the great finishers in this storied rivalry. Ray Goff, as a player, was 2-1 and one against Auburn. And as a coach, he won for the first time last year, 37-27, to 27, back between the hedges. Scott Armstrong came into the ballgame averaging 38.2 yards per punt. And this will be his most crucial one of the day. Fourth and 14. Willis, after that last tackle, with 15 on the day. A nice high punt, not too deep at the 50-yard line. Bailey. Bailey with a nice return of six yards, six hard-fought yards after that 34-yard punt. 2.36 remaining. The tackle was made by James Warner of Georgia. The wheels are turning inside that man's head, John, no doubt. This is it. This is the last drive here. Well, a nice way for Pat Dye to get his 100th win in this game, which means so much to him as a former Georgia Bulldog. White on the afternoon, 14-23, 190 yards, but a big interception last time. 
two wide receivers out to the top of your screen. Out of the backfield, wide open, is McMillan. Reed McMillan sneaks into the game. He's been injured for the past few weeks and makes his first catch of the day. That's a good play. I mean, there's a big stretch downfield. McMillian there slips through. When you have all your receivers downfield, you can slip your back through. And he's able almost to get a first down. Not quite. Dorn coming out of the ball game. McMillian was their leading rusher before he was injured. Here he is again. And he gains the first down. It's John, what do you think? Is Dye trying to bring in a fresh back, a fresh set of legs? Is that it? Not really. What he wanted to do there was just get the first down because as they move the chains in college, the clock stops. White's getting a play call as quickly as he can. The clock is stopped at 157, and the officials will wind it as soon as the ball is set. Now the play is called, and effectively Auburn can get a play called without using any time at all. A field goal doesn't help them. They need a score. White. Throws it complete and out of bounds to Sanders at the 17-yard line. Stan White, cool under pressure. Speaking of cool under pressure, Stan White waited for this pattern to develop. The receiver got bumped around a little bit, and he had to really thread that in there. Very well-thrown ball. Sanders had to work inside, then work back outside, and he was getting bounced around a little bit. White had enough time, and he had the presence of mind to stay with him and then change the kind of throw, stick it in there. White and uh, Sanders broke it flat to the sideline, which is what he had to do in order to make that pass complete. First down. Ball on the 17-yard line. 1.46 to go. White batted down at the line of scrimmage by Mitch Davis. Actually, that might have helped Auburn on that particular play because it didn't look like a lot was happening. The clock has stopped at 142. And I don't know where that ball was really intended because I saw nothing but Georgia Bulldogs and it looked like it was going to be a short pass. Yeah, they had Bailey and Parker split to this side of the field. He was looking in that direction, but it never had a chance. Well, this is definitely three down, four down territory. Second and ten ball on the 17-yard line and Auburn is going to have to throw to win here. They need to get the ball in the end zone. And the silent count with White. Stan White down to the eight-yard line. He was hit there by Travis Jones. He's just shy of the first down. At the conclusion of today's game, we'll be selecting a Chevy MVP from each team for the 22nd year. The program, $1,000, will be donated to the General Scholarship Fund of each school. Oh, Auburn needs to, they're, they're in disarray right now. Third and one. The handoff to Boston. Wow. I don't think he got it. You called it, John. They, they had two sets. That's right. They, Mark, they had two substitutions on that play to run a draw play. I guess they ran it in from the sidelines, but now the clock keeps ticking. Auburn doesn't win to use the timeout, but it's fourth down. They have to use a timeout here. They have one timeout left. And they have to convert this. This is it. Fourth and two. Bostic. He got it. Oh. All on second effort. And the clock is running with, and now it stops. Stops with the first down conversion. But I, I would have used the time out there. I think they're a little bit lucky to be able to convert that thing the way they did. I mean, that was the play. Now it's first and five on the five. Four down, he go. Dan White has done an excellent job this afternoon. There's a timeout on the field. 29 seconds to go on the game clock. Do not leave. There have been many a dramatic finish in this series between Georgia and Auburn, and this one could be second to none. It's first down and goal for the Tigers. The ball is on the five-yard line. Auburn has just used its last time out. They have none remaining. It's a full house backfield. Boston and Parker and Frazier. This is Parker. He's got the corner. He did not get no in. signal. Out of bounds at the one foot line. 
That is a terrific call. I'm wondering why they're in a full house backfield with no timeouts, but instead of using a running back at the right side of that T formation with three backs there, they slip in Parker, the fastest guy on the football field. And I'll tell you, if he knew a little bit more about running, he might have been able to get in there. I mean, he tried the best he could, the ball extended, get in the end zone. That ball is on the half yard line. Now watch him try to extend now. I think he tried a little bit too late to extend that football. That is a great call to the wide side of the field with Parker on the right side of that T formation. And now I believe George has called a timeout. Boy, does Pat Dye have his thinking cap on or what? I honestly had no, because I knew with 29 seconds left, if they ran the football and they didn't obviously get in the end zone, the clock would keep going. They couldn't make a first down. They're out of timeouts. And Georgia and slips that play in, and they're able to get, get away with it and use it. That's Georgia with one timeout remaining. And I, and I bet you, Mark, that probably part of the thinking there was if you think you're going to get hit or you don't think you can get the end zone, get right out of bounds. Just ready to use, use your 10, 600 meter stick and get out of bounds. And that, that's exactly what Parker did, but he was able to turn the corner and almost get in the end zone. That's probably what Dye said to Parker. He said, hey, if you're not going to get a touchdown, then run to the closest sideline. Here's the issue now. 19 seconds left in the game. Second down, goal to go. You might be able to run the football, but boy, if you get stopped, I would think that the first thing you have to do is just line up and stop the football, throw it on the ground, and, and just uh, just do whatever you can do as a quarterback. Just line everybody up and throw the football down on the ground. Down the football, and you might have about five seconds left to call one more running play. Then again, you have the bootleg situation, which they might try and do, and throw the ball incomplete, and then maybe try and run on third down. Here Second we go. and goal, two tight ends in. Full house backfield. Fumble. No signal and a fumble. Line up, line up, line up, the clock is running. The clock is running. The clock is running. The officials have to set the football here. And time runs out on Auburn. Time runs out. That's it. What a bizarre ending to this football game. There was a fumble on that play, but the officials should call timeout and take an official timeout. They couldn't unstack the pile. And the ball lay there as the clock wound down. But for 15 seconds, you'd normally see officials wave their hands to determine, wave their hands over their heads to determine just exactly uh, what's going on, and that's an official timeout. That probably should have happened in that situation. As we say, Ray Goff and Pat Dye talk right now, and oh, the disappointment on Pat Dye's face. The Auburn drive dies at the one-yard line. People are standing on their feet with their mouths open. They can't believe the way this game has ended. They are in stunned silence, and they're not leaving. Nobody's leaving. They, they, they want the officials to rectify this thing. And I really have to question what happened there with the officiating. I, I believe that there's a situation where they could have called an official timeout to at least unwind the bodies and figure out who had the football. And you know for a fact, John, that Georgia players were going to be very slow to get off of that ball. That they were. That they were, that they did. And they're well coached in that regard. They knew what to do. But what a bizarre end. Look at Ray Goff. I mean, he's, he doesn't know what happened. Hyperventilating. Stan White with a yeoman effort this afternoon. He played his heart out. And to see the game die on the one-yard line and end in a graveyard at the one-yard line is just heart-wrenching. I mean, the atmosphere, the atmosphere here is almost surreal. People are just to look at them. People are standing. They're shocked. They're dismayed. They're disappointed. They, they really don't understand how this game could have ended the way it has. It's almost as if they want to stay here and wait until the players are brought back out on the field. But it, it won't happen. It's a final. 14 to 10, Georgia wins. And, uh, you know, they're going to take the programs from these games and put them in a time capsule and open them up 50 years from now and 100 years from now for future generations to read and look at. I, I wonder if they're going to put an asterisk in there and, and write the final score and say how it ended. You know, John, what appeared to be a lifetime down there at the goal line, time enough to run at least two plays. They ran one, Auburn did, and it's ball game over. Absolutely. I still think, I think Ray Goss thinking that he's still waiting to see the officials see if they're going to run back on the field and say, hey, you have to play another down. And, you know, for Pat Dye and his Auburn squad, 
that loss is in some way symbolic of the way that their season has gone. That is so true. It has been a mountain of frustration as the Georgia Bulldogs and other five run off victorious 14 to 10. We want to give you some bonus coverage in the Pac-10. Arizona facing a USC in this one has been back and forth. Arizona had the lead, but USC is on top now. 14 to 7 is the lead. Let's now join Tim Brandt and Lynn Swan. Gentlemen. We want to welcome those of you who have been watching the game between Georgia and Auburn. Welcome to the LA Memorial Coliseum. Tim Brandt along with Lynn Swan in a game that has been to this point sensational. Three minutes remain in the ball game. And SC has the lead over Arizona, 14 to 7. Keep in mind, the Wildcats on a five-game win streak beat top-ranked Washington last week. Aspirations of the Rose Bowl, and now they're on the ropes. This is McFadden. White McFadden doesn't get much. Scoring summary: Estes Creighton got USC on the board. That made it six nothing. Missed the extra point. Then Kerry Taylor with a 41-yard touchdown reception from Malaulu on a spectacular play. And then USC came back on a terrific drive just moments ago. Gadget play, pitches it to Deion Strother who turns and throws it. And watch Rob Johnson go up and take it away from the starting cornerback for the Wildcats, Daryl Morrison, number 27. And then Rob Johnson comes back with a, a rifle to Conway for the two-point conversion. And that brings the score to 14-7. to seven. Rob Johnson, former, former receiver in high school. But we should tell you this. USC missed field goals on their first two possessions of the game. They could be leading by more. Well, it's been an absolutely beautiful day here in Los Angeles for the kickers, both USC and for Arizona. They've had a tough, tough afternoon. Timeout taken by Arizona. They have two remaining. SC has one left. SC was held just to 17 yards in the third quarter. And then here in the fourth with 76 yards for a touchdown. We anticipated, especially for all of you that just joined us, that this was going to be a defensive struggle, and it has been. Both teams on defense have played exceptionally hard, but there have been some offensive standouts for Southern California and for Arizona. Rob Johnson, we mentioned already, for Arizona. Troy Dickey, number 84, has been playing phenomenally for his team. SC will try to melt the clock. Arizona's defense, Desert Swarm, will try to stop them, and here they do. It won't be enough for the first. Struther, the carrier. The importance of this game we alluded to a moment ago. Washington still in control of its own destiny. And has to win out, and they will go on to the Rose Bowl. Arizona has to win out and hope that Washington either loses or ties and then Arizona goes. And Washington won the day so their record will go up to six and one. Arizona takes its last time out here as you look at the remaining schedules. Arizona taking on their state rival. USC here or actually in Pasadena and next week Washington and Washington State in Pullman. 2.39 left in the game, so Arizona's timeout leaves them with one, and SC also has one. Now it's fourth down. Obviously, USC is going to punt the football. Heath Bray, number 14 for the Arizona Wildcats, is the backup quarterback, but he is also captain of special teams. I bring this up because his nickname is Crash. He has blocked five punts in his career. He has blocked two in 1992. So I believe that Larry Smith has his team on the sideline, is getting them ready to make sure they don't make mistakes when Heath Bray comes lines up on them. You saw a look at Dick Tomey. He was one, two, and one at the end of September. Has not lost since. He's in second place, a half game behind Washington. He met with every player individually during those hard times. Turned the frustrations into energy and it's paid off. And this has been the kind of football game where you have to make sure you follow through on every play. You take nothing for granted. Heath 
Gray, number 14. John Stonehouse to do the punting for SC. Terry Vaughn is deep, standing at his own 35. John Stonehouse, the punt formation. Terry Vaughn back to receive. A high tail wagger of a punt. Vaughn at the 40 gives a weak, fair catch signal, and that's where it will be down to 39 yard punt. We want to welcome those of you who have been watching the Ohio State Indiana game. Tim Brant and Lynn Swan with you at the LA Coliseum. 226 remaining in this ball game. And USC leads Arizona 14 to 7. The Wildcats with a football. Malaulu. With time over the middle, incomplete and Vaughn was open. Tim Brandon Lynn Swan with you. And it has been a very physical football game. USC took the early lead 6-0 and held that lead throughout most of the ball game and missed the extra point. The Wildcats came back in the second half, take a 7-6 lead. Let's take you through that scoring summary, Swanee. Okay, Astros Creighton gets the first touchdown ever scored on Arizona this season in the first half, but they missed the extra point. Then Taylor comes in with a big touchdown catch and the extra point, they take the lead. Malaulu with pressure across the middle and Dickey can't hold on. The USC touchdown that put the Trojans ahead was spectacular. It was Rob Johnson flipping back to Deion Strether, 25. He throws it, and the high school receiver, now turned college quarterback, leaps high into the air to take it away from Wildcat Daryl Morrison. Then they come right back. Curtis Conway catches a Johnson pass with a two-point conversion and puts USC up by seven. Rob Johnson with a spectacular catch. 2.16 left as you look at Dick Tobey. Third and 10. Malahulu has it knocked away. SC has it. It looked like number 24, Mike Salmon, may have recovered it. Jeff Kopp knocked it loose. Salmon recovered it. And this place is rocking. It has been a spectacular defensive game all afternoon. You see right there, 35. Jeff Kopp punching it away. Salmon, number 24, he's been playing great all afternoon, making plays at the corner position, the corner of the defensive line, shutting down some running plays, tackles behind the line of scrimmage, and now coming up with a second big turnover against the Wildcats. Big old Vince Smith, 72, 6'5", 360 pounder makes his way off the Coliseum turf. Uncharacteristic three turnovers for Arizona today. This game has been special. Johnson, the quarterback. Conway in motion. And straight ahead goes Bender. Blasts his way inside the 20. Correction, it's Mooney to the 19 and flags fly. Well, at this point, it's pretty obvious what USC is, is going to attempt to do. Keep the ball on the ground, stay conservative, use up that clock, and Dick Toomey hoping for an opportunity to get the ball back without USC scoring. Dead ball. Personal foul, defense, players been ejected. Well, folks, I didn't see what was done, but obviously the officials felt strong enough about this, about whatever took place to eject the player. This has been a tough physical football game all afternoon, and no one has done anything up to this point out of the ordinary in terms of the physical nature of hitting after the player late or out of bounds. So this is very unusual. Conway goes out of the ball game, and Wallace comes in. Morton goes out, and Jackson comes in as they go into. Tell you what, let's look at the end of the play. Watch number three, Bowie. 
He's a safety. Look at him right there. He goes down and just sticks the knee into, who was that, 82, Brad Banta, and I believe he would be the man ejected at this moment. Louie goes out. The last thing Dick Toomey wanted to have happen in this ball game. Wait a minute, Bowie's still on the field in a safety spot. And Hopkins has gone out. Have any expiration of time, 155. Thank you. Now move the clock from 201 down to 155. But watch, 82 Hopkins to the left of your screen. I see 82 right there. He didn't do anything. I mean, I think if they ejected 82, they ejected the wrong man. Well, they did. Because if you look out there on the three-yard line, Tony Bowie is standing right there in the safety position. Could it be a number? Could, it, could they be wearing double numbers? Washington does that a lot. Let's take another look. Number 82 at the top of the screen. Oh, there it is. Got him early. He kicked him. Got him early. He kicked him in the head and walked around as if he hadn't done anything. Rose Bowl. We've been talking about Arizona all day and about how they trailed Washington by half a game and needed Washington to tie or lose. What about USC? Still mathematically alive. They're mathematically alive. Obviously, they have to win all their games, but uh, Washington won big this afternoon. McFadden started the ball game. They wanted to establish some kind of run. They were initially successful in a couple of opportunities. We'd set up some good first down plays for Rob Johnson in the passing attack. Clock continues to move, 104-103. Arizona has won this game the last two years against the Trojans. And Tim, this is an emotional win for Larry Smith, having coached at Arizona. Last year when he went down there, there were some problems. The fans booed him and some hard feelings expressed. Now he comes back to the Coliseum after a loss to Stanford. Had they won, they would have been tied with Washington for first place in the Pac-10. They have that loss. He comes back here. He gets his team fired up. And when I watched him at practice, he was... He was on the edge. He looked like he was on the crest of emotion, feeling that everything was working right this week for a big game and a big win against Arizona. Washington won today, 45 to 16, so that then would eliminate USC. And a loss here by Arizona and the win by Washington would put the Huskies in the Rose Bowl. Absolutely. 48 seconds remain. Well, Dick Toomey is to be congratulated for what he's accomplished with this football program and this team. Having knocked off Washington, bounced him out of the number one spot. The and let's give that man, to Miami. Let's give that man some credit right there. Larry Smith, now in his sixth year, he's taken a lot of heat following last year's three and eight record. Some of the alumni very vociferous. And then last week's loss to Stanford heard some of those echoes again. But he's won three Pac-10 titles and gets a big win here today. Still fired up. Oh yeah, he is. You know, you get revved up for a game this big. A lot of people that he knows and the administrative staff from Arizona are here. Some friends come in. He needs us win for his team's confidence. He can't let down. Hannah goes to the top of the screen. Johnson just keeps it. Pushes the pack straight ahead. Washington goes to six and one. SC will go to five and two. And Arizona will move to four, two and one which gives the Huskies the Rose Bowl. Certainly does, even if, if USC were to win next week and Washington were to lose, they tie, but going head to head, Washington beat USC. So they end up in Pasadena, but it's very important. USC win this ball game, 
to get the numbers up there in terms of their eligibility for a bowl. Got to have a minimum of six wins to be in the bowl game. Clock continues to move. This one's in the bank. USC just standing on the field, taking the penalty, but forcing the clock to go all the way down to eight seconds. And they still have the ball at fourth down. SC held to 17 yards in the third quarter. Arizona took the lead, and the momentum had definitely changed. But USC came back big in the fourth. Well, USC, is even with the win here, is still a program that has a lot of room to grow. They struggled a lot this year. They, early in the season, they were giving up points, spotting the team. They spotted Washington all 17 points when they lost to them. Had some terrible turnovers back in their own territory and won some lack lackadaisical games in the season. This team is still a talented football team that has a lot of room to improve, but so does Arizona. The Pac-10 is going to be a very, very tough conference. That'll do it. The Trojans of USC will go to 6-2-1. The Wildcats of Arizona will go to 6-3 and 1. Arizona has that much time remaining. This has been a, a hard fought physical football game for both teams. Lulu, the quarterback, three receivers to the top, and the pre-bet defense by the Trojans. Ooh. Incomplete, and that'll do it. USC wins it 14 to seven. The Chevrolet most valuable players of the game are Troy Dickey, five receptions, 95 yards from Arizona, and Rob Johnson from USC, 12 for 24, 213 yards, and the winning touchdown catch. Chevrolet will donate $1,000 to each school's general scholarship fund to reward outstanding students for their academic achievements and to assist those in financial need.